Chapter One of Lost Man's Lane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England. Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. Preface a word to my readers before they begin these pages as a woman of inborn principle and strict presbyterian training i hate deception and cannot abide subterfuge this is why after a year or more of hesitation i have felt myself constrained to put into words the true history of the events surrounding the solution of that great mystery which made lost man's lane the dread of the neighbouring country feminine delicacy and a natural shrinking from revealing to the world certain weaknesses on my part inseparable from a true relation of this tale led me to consent to the publication of that meagre and decidedly falsified account of the matter which has appeared in some of our leading papers but conscience has regained its sway in my breast and with all due confidence in your forbearance I herein take my rightful place in these annals, of whose interest and importance I now leave you to judge. Amelia Butterworth, Gramercy Park, New York. Book One, The Knollis Family. Chapter One, A Visit from Mr. Grice. Ever since my fortunate, or shall I say, unfortunate connection with that famous case of murder in gramercy park i have had it intimated to me by many of my friends and by some who were not my friends that no woman who had met with such success as myself in detective work would ever be satisfied with a single display of her powers and that sooner or later i would find myself again at work upon some other case of striking peculiarities as vanity has never been my foible and as moreover i never have forsaken and never am likely to forsake the plain path marked out for my sex at any other call than that of duty i invariably responded to these insinuations by an affable but incredulous smile striving to excuse the presumption of my friends by remembering their ignorance of my nature and the very excellent reasons i had for my one notable interference in the police affairs of new york city besides though i appeared to be resting quietly if not in entire contentment on my laurels i was not so utterly removed from the old atmosphere of crime and its detection as the world in general considered me to be mr grice still visited me not on business of course but as a friend for whom i had some regard and naturally our conversation was not always confined to the weather or even to city politics provocative as the latter subject is of wholesome controversy not that he ever betrayed any of the secrets of his office oh no that would have been too much to expect but he did sometimes mention the outward aspects of some celebrated case and though i never ventured upon advice i know too much for that i hope i found my wits more or less exercised by a conversation in which he gained much without acknowledging it and i gave much without appearing conscious of the fact i was therefore finding life pleasant and full of interest when suddenly i had no right to expect it and i do not blame myself for not expecting it or for holding my head so high at the prognostications of my friends an opportunity came for a direct exercise of my detective powers in a line seemingly so laid out for me by providence that i felt i would be slighting the powers above if i refused to enter upon it though now i see that the line was laid out for me by mr grice and that i was obeying anything but the call of duty in following it but this is not explicit one night mr grice came to my house looking older and more feeble than usual he was engaged in a perplexing case he said 
and missed his early vigour and persistency, would I like to hear about it? It was not in the line of his usual work, yet it had points, and, well, it would do him good to talk about it to a non-professional who was capable of sympathising with its baffling and worrisome features, and yet would never have to be told to hold her peace. I ought to have been on my guard. I ought to have known the old fox well enough to feel certain that when he went so manifestly out of his way to take me into his confidence, he did it for a purpose. But Jove nods now and then, or so I have been assured on unimpeachable authority, and if Jove has ever been caught napping, surely Amelia Butterworth may be pardoned a like inconsistency. It is not a city crime, Mr. Grice went on to explain and here he was base enough to sigh. At my time of life, this is an important consideration. It is no longer a simple matter for me to pack up a valise and go off to some distant village, way up in the mountains, perhaps, where comforts are few and secrecy an impossibility. Comforts have become indispensable to my threescore years and ten, and secrecy, well, if ever there was an affair where one needs to go softly, it is this one, as you will see if you allow me to give you the facts of the case as known at headquarters today. I bowed, trying not to show my surprise or my extreme satisfaction. Mr. Grice assumed his most benignant aspect, always a dangerous one with him, and began his story. End of chapter one. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England. Chapter Two of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England. I am tempted. Some ninety miles from here, in a more or less inaccessible region, there is a small but interesting village which has been the scene of so many unaccountable disappearances that the attention of the New York police has at last been directed to it. The village, which is at least two miles from any railroad, is one of those quiet, placid little spots found now and then among the mountains, where life is simple and crime, to all appearance, an element so out of accord with every other characteristic of the place as to seem a complete anomaly. Yet crime, or some other hideous mystery almost equally revolting, has, during the last five years, been accountable for the disappearance in or about this village of four persons of various ages and occupations. Of these, three were strangers, and one a well-known vagabond accustomed to tramp the hills and live on the bounty of farmers' wives. All were of the male sex, and in no case has any clue ever come to light as to their fate that is the matter as it stands before the police to-day a serious affair i remarked seems to me i have read of such things in novels is there a tumbled-down old inn in the vicinity where beds are made up over trap-doors his smile was a mild protest against my flippancy i have visited the town myself there is no inn there but a comfortable hotel of the most matter-of-fact sort kept by the frankest and most open-minded of landlords. Besides, these disappearances, as a rule, did not take place at night, but in broad daylight. Imagine this street at noon. It is a short one, and you know every house on it, and you think you know every lurking place. You see a man enter it at one end, and you expect him to issue from it at the other. But suppose he never does. More than that, suppose he is never heard of again and that this thing should happen in this one street four times during five years i should move i dryly responded would you many good people have moved from the place i speak of but that has not helped matters the disappearances go on just the same and the mystery continues you interest me i said come to think of it 
if this street were the scene of such an unexplained series of horrors as you have described i do not think i should move i thought not he curtly rejoined but since you are interested in this matter let me be more explicit in my statements the first person whose disappearance was noted wait i interrupted have you a map of the place he smiled nodded quite affectionately to a little statuette on the mantelpiece which had had the honour of sharing his confidences in days gone by but did not produce the map that detail will keep said he let me go on with my story as i was saying madam the first person whose disappearance was noted in this place was a peddler of small wares accustomed to tramp the mountains on this occasion he had been in town longer than usual and was known to have sold fully half of his goods consequently he must have had quite a sum of money upon him one day his pack was found lying under a cluster of bushes in a wood but of him nothing was ever heard again it made an excitement for a few days while the woods were being searched for his body but nothing having been discovered he was forgotten and everything went on as before till suddenly public attention was again aroused by the pouring in of letters containing inquiries in regard to a young man who had been sent there from duluth to collect facts in a law case and who after a certain date had failed to communicate with his firm or show up at any of the places where he was known instantly the village was in arms many remembered the young man and some two or three of the villagers could recall the fact of having seen him go up the street with his handbag in his hand as if on his way to the mountain station the landlord of the hotel could fix the very day at which he left his house but inquiries at the station failed to establish the fact that he took train from there nor were the most minute inquiries into his fate ever attended by the least result he was not known to have carried much money but he carried a very handsome watch and wore a ring of more than ordinary value neither of which has ever shown up at any pawnbrokers known to the police this was three years ago the next occurrence of a like character did not take place till a year after this time it was a poor old man from hartford who vanished almost as it were before the eyes of these astounded villagers he had come to town to get subscriptions for a valuable book issued by a well-known publisher he had been more or less successful and was looking very cheerful and contented when one morning after making a sale at a certain farmhouse he sat down to dine with the family it being close on to noon he had eaten several mouthfuls and was chatting quite freely when suddenly they saw him pause clap his hand to his pocket and rise up very much disturbed i have left my pocket-book behind me at deacon spears he cried i cannot eat with it out of my possession excuse me if i go for it and without any further apologies he ran out of the house and down the road in the direction of deacon spears he never reached deacon spears nor was he ever seen in that village again or in his home in hartford this was the most astonishing mystery of all within a half mile's radius in a populous country town this man disappeared as if the road had swallowed him and closed again it was marvellous it was incredible and remained so even after the best efforts of the country police to solve the mystery had exhausted themselves after this the town began to acquire a bad name and one or two families moved away yet no one was found who was willing to admit that these various persons had been the victims of foul play till a month later another case came to light of a young man who had left the village for the hillside station and had never arrived at that or any other destination so far as could be learned as he was a distant relative of a wealthy cattle owner in iowa who came on post haste to inquire into his nephew's fate the excitement ran high and through his efforts and that of one of the town's leading citizens the services of our office were called into play but the result has been nil we have found neither the bodies of these men nor any clue to their fate yet you have been there 
I suggested. He nodded. Wonderful! And you came upon no suspicious house, no suspicious person? The finger with which he was rubbing his eyeglasses went round and round the rims with a slower and slower and still more thoughtful motion. Every town has its suspicious-looking houses, he slowly remarked, and as for persons, the most honest often wear a lowering look in which an unbridled imagination can see guilt. I never trust to appearances of that kind. What else can you trust in, when a case is as impenetrable as this one? I asked. His finger, going slower and slower, suddenly stopped. In my knowledge of persons, he replied, in my knowledge of their fears, their hopes, and their individual concerns, if I were twenty years younger, here he stole a glance at me in the mirror, which made me bridle. Did he think I was only twenty years younger than himself? I would, he went on, make myself so acquainted with every man, woman, and child there that, here he drew himself up with a jerk. But the day for that is past, said he. I am too old and too crippled to succeed in such an undertaking. Having been there once, I am a marked man. My very walk betrays me. He whose good fortune it will be to get at the bottom of these people's hearts must awaken no suspicions as to his connection with the police. Indeed, I do not think that any man can succeed in doing this now. I started. This was a frank showing of his hand, at least. No man. It was then a woman's aid he was after. I laughed as I thought of it. I had not thought him either so presumptuous or so appreciative of talents of a character so directly in line with his own. Don't you agree with me, madam? I did agree with him, but I had a character of great dignity to maintain, so I simply surveyed him with an air of well-tempered severity. I do not know of any woman who would undertake such a task, I calmly observed. No? He smiled with that air of forbearance which is so exasperating to me. Well, perhaps there isn't any such woman to be found. It would take one of very uncommon characteristics, I own. Pish! I cried. Not so very. Indeed, I think you have not fully taken in the case, he urged in quiet superiority. The people there are of the higher order of country folk. Many of them are of extreme refinement. One family, here his tone changed a trifle, is poor enough and cultivated enough to interest even such a woman as yourself. Indeed, I ejaculated, with just a touch of my father's hauteur to hide the stir of curiosity his words naturally evoked. It is in some such home, he continued, with an ease that should have warned me he had started on this pursuit with a quiet determination to win, that the clue will be found to the mystery we are considering. Yes, you may well look startled, but that conclusion is the one thing I brought away with me from X, let us say. I regard it as one of some moment. What do you think of it? Well, I admitted, it makes me feel like recalling that pish i uttered a few minutes ago it would take a woman of uncommon characteristics to assist you in this matter i am glad we have got that far said he a lady i went on most assuredly a lady i paused sometimes discreet silence is more sarcastic than speech well what lady would lend herself to this scheme i demanded at last the tap tap of his fingers on the rim of his glasses was my only answer i do not know of any said i his eyebrows rose perhaps a hair's breadth but i noted the implied sarcasm and for an instant forgot my dignity now said i this will not do you mean me amelia butterworth a woman who but i do not think it is necessary to tell you either who or what i am you have presumed sir now 
do not put on that look of innocence and above all do not attempt to deny what is so manifestly in your thoughts for that would make me feel like showing you the door then he smiled i shall be sure to deny nothing i am not anxious to leave yet besides whom could i mean but you a lady visiting friends in this remote and beautiful region what opportunities might she not have to probe this important mystery if like yourself she had tact discretion excellent understanding and an experience which if not broad or deep is certainly such as to give her a certain confidence in herself and an undoubted influence with the man fortunate enough to receive her advice bah i exclaimed it was one of his favourite expressions that was perhaps why i used it one would think i was a member of your police you flatter us too deeply was his deferential answer such an honour as that would be beyond our deserts to this i gave but the faintest sniff that he should think that i amelia butterworth could be amenable to such barefaced flattery then i faced him with some asperity and said bluntly you waste your time i have no more intention of meddling in another affair than you had in meddling in the first he politely too politely interpolated i understand madam i was angry but made no show of being so i was not willing he should see that i could be affected by anything he could say the van burnhams are my next-door neighbours i remarked sweetly i had the best of excuses for the interest i took in their affairs so you had he acquiesced i am glad to be reminded of the fact i wonder i was able to forget it angry now to the point of not being able to hide it i turned upon him with firm determination let us talk of something else i said but he was equal to the occasion drawing a folded paper from his pocket he opened it out before my eyes observing quite naturally that is a happy thought let us look over this sketch you were sharp enough to ask for a few moments ago it shows the streets of the village and the places where each of the persons i have mentioned was last seen is not that what you wanted i know that i should have drawn back with a frown that i never should have allowed myself the satisfaction of casting so much as a glance toward the paper but the human nature which links me to my kind was too much for me and with an involuntary exactly i leaned over it with an eagerness i strove hard even at that exciting moment to keep within the bounds i thought proper to my position as a non-professional interested in the matter from curiosity alone this is what i saw there is a small picture of a map at this point mr gryce said i after a few minutes close contemplation of this diagram i do not suppose you want any opinion from me madam he retorted it is all you have left me free to ask for receiving this as a permission to speak i put my finger on the road marked with a cross then said i so far as i can gather from this drawing all the disappearances seem to have taken place in or about this especial road you are correct as usual he returned what you have said is so true that the people of the vicinity have already given to this winding way a special cognomen of its own for two years now it has been called lost man's lane indeed i cried they have got the matter down as close as that and yet have not solved its mystery how long is this road a half mile or so i must have looked my disgust for his hands opened deprecatingly the ground has undergone a thorough search said he not a square foot in those woods you see on either side of the road but has been carefully examined and the houses i see there are three houses on this road oh they are owned by most respectable people most respectable people he repeated with a lingering emphasis that gave me an inward shudder i think i had the honour of intimating as much to you a few minutes ago i looked at him earnestly and irresistibly drew a little nearer to him over the diagram 
"'Have none of these houses been visited by you?' I asked. "'Do you mean to say you have not seen the inside of them all?' "'Oh,' he replied, "'I have been in them all, of course. "'But a mystery such as we are investigating "'is not written upon the walls of parlours or halls.' "'You freeze my blood,' was my uncharacteristic rejoinder. Somehow, the sight of the homes indicated on this diagram seemed to bring me into more intimate sympathy with the affair. His shrug was significant. I told you that this was no vulgar mystery, he declared, or why should I be considering it with you? It is quite worthy of your interest. Do you see that house marked A? I do, I nodded. Well, that is a decayed mansion of imposing proportions, set in a forest of overgrown shrubbery. The ladies who inhabit it... Ladies, I put in, with a small shock of horror. Young ladies, he explained, of a refined, if not over-prosperous appearance. They are the interesting residue of a family of some repute. Their father was a judge, I believe. And do they live there alone? I asked. Two young ladies in a house so large and in a neighbourhood so full of mystery? Oh, they have a brother with them, a lout of no great attractions, he responded carelessly. Too carelessly, I thought. I made a note of the house A in my mind. And who lives in the house marked B? I now queried. A Mr. Trome. You will remember that it was through his exertions the services of the New York police were secured. His place there is one of the most interesting in town, and he does not wish to be forced to leave it, but he will be obliged to do so if the road is not soon relieved of its bad name. And so will Deacon Spear. The very children shun the road now. I do not know of a lonelier place. I see a little mark made here on the verge of the woods. What does that mean? That stands for a hut. It can hardly be called a cottage where a poor old woman lives called Mother Jane. She is a harmless imbecile, against whom no one has ever directed a suspicion. You may take your finger off that mark, Miss Butterworth. I did so, but I did not forget that it stood very near the footpath branching off to the station. You entered this hut, as well as the big houses, I intimated. And found, was his answer, four walls, nothing more. I let my finger travel along the footpath I have just mentioned. Steep was his comment. Up, up, all the way, but no precipices, nothing but pine woods on either side, thickly carpeted with needles. My finger came back and stopped at the house marked M. Why is a letter affixed to this spot? I asked. Because it stands at the head of the lane. Any one sitting at the window L can see whoever enters or leaves the lane at this end, and someone is always sitting there. The house contains two crippled children, a boy and a girl. One of them is always in that window. I see, said I. Then, abruptly, what do you think of Deacon Spear? Oh, he's a well-meaning man, none too fine in his feelings. He does not mind the neighbourhood, likes quiet, he says. I hope you will know him for yourself some day, the detective slyly added. At this return to the forbidden subject, I held myself very much aloof. Your diagram is interesting, I remarked, but it has not in the least changed my determination. It is you who will return to X, and that very soon. Very soon, he repeated. Whoever goes there on this errand must go at once, tonight if possible. If not, tomorrow at the latest. Tonight? Tomorrow? I expostulated. And you thought? No matter what I thought, he sighed. It seems I had no reason for my hopes. And folding up the map, he slowly rose. The young man we have left there is doing more harm than good. That is why I say that someone of real ability must replace him immediately. The detective from New York must seem to have left the place. I made him my most ladylike bow of dismissal. I shall watch the papers, I said. I have no doubt that I shall soon be gratified by seeing in them some token of your success. 
he cast a rueful look at his hands took a painful step toward the door and dolefully shook his head i kept my silence undisturbed he took another painful step then turned by the way he remarked as i stood watching him with an uncompromising air i have forgotten to mention the name of the town in which these disappearances have occurred it is called x and it is to be found on one of the spurs of the berkshire hills and being by this time at the door he bowed himself out with all the insinuating suavity which distinguishes him at certain critical moments the old fox was so sure of his triumph that he did not wait to witness it he knew how it is easy enough for me to understand now that x was a place i had often threatened to visit the family of one of my dearest friends lived there the children of althea knollys she had been my chum at school and when she died i had promised myself not to let many months go by without making the acquaintance of her children alas I had allowed years to elapse. End of chapter 2 Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England Chapter 3 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England I Succumb that night the tempter had his own way with me. Without much difficulty he persuaded me that my neglect of Althea Burroughs' children was without any excuse, that what had been my duty toward them when I knew them to be left motherless and alone had become an imperative demand upon me now that the town in which they lived had become overshadowed by a mystery which could not but affect the comfort and happiness of all its inhabitants. I could not wait a day. I recalled all that I had heard of poor Althea's short and none too happy marriage, and immediately felt such a burning desire to see if her dainty but spirited beauty, how well I remembered it, had been repeated in her daughters, that I found myself packing my trunk before I knew it. I had not been from home for a long time, all the more reason why I should have a change now and when i notified mrs randolph and the servants of my intention of leaving on the early morning train it created quite a sensation in the house but i had the best of explanations to offer i had been thinking of my dead friend and my conscience would not let me neglect her dear and possibly unhappy progeny any longer i had purposed many times to visit x and now i was going to do it when I come to a decision, it is usually suddenly, and I never rest after having once made up my mind. My sentiment went so far that I got down an old album, and began hunting up the pictures I had brought away with me from boarding school. Hers was among them, and I really did experience more or less compunction when I saw again the delicate yet daring features which had once had a very great influence over my mind. What a teasing sprite she was, yet what a will she had, and how strange it was that, having been so intimate as girls, we never knew anything of each other as women. Had it been her fault or mine? Was her marriage to blame for it, or my spinsterhood? Difficult to tell then, impossible to tell now. I would not even think of it again, save as a warning nothing must stand between me and her children now that my attention has been called to them again i did not mean to take them by surprise that is not entirely the invitation which they had sent me years ago was still in force making it simply necessary for me to telegraph them that i had decided to make them a visit and that they might expect me by the noon train if in times gone by they had been properly instructed by their mother in regard to the character of her old friend, this need not put them out. I am not a woman of unbounded expectations. I do not look for the comforts abroad I am accustomed to find at home, and if, as I have reason to believe, their means are not of the greatest, they would only provoke me by any show of effort to make me feel at home in the humble cottage suited to their fortunes. 
so the telegram was sent and my preparations completed for an early departure but resolved as i was to make this visit my determination came near receiving a check just as i was leaving the house at the very moment in fact when the hackman was carrying out my trunk i perceived a man approaching me with every evidence of haste he had a letter in his hand which he held out to me as soon as he came within reach for miss butterworth he announced private and immediate ah thought i a communication from mr gryce and hesitated for a moment whether to open it on the spot or to wait and read it at my leisure on the cars the latter course promised me less inconvenience than the first for my hands were cumbered with the various small articles i consider indispensable to the comfortable enjoyment of the shortest journey and the glasses without which i cannot read a word were in the very bottom of my pocket under many other equally necessary articles but something in the man's expectant look warned me that he would never leave me till i had read the note so with a sigh i called lena to my aid and after several vain attempts to reach my glasses succeeded at last in pulling them out and by their help reading the following hurried lines dear madam i send you this by a swifter messenger than myself do not let anything that i may have said last night influence you to leave your comfortable home the adventure offers too many dangers for a woman read the enclosed g the enclosed was a telegram from x sent during the night and evidently just received at headquarters its contents were certainly not reassuring another person missing last seen in lost man's lane a harmless lad known as silly rufus what's to be done wire orders trome mr gryce bade me say that he would be up here some time before noon said the man seeing me look with some blankness at these words nothing more was needed to restore my self-possession folding up the letter i put it in my bag say to mr gryce from me that my intended visit cannot be postponed i replied i have telegraphed to my friends to expect me and only a great emergency would lead me to disappoint them i will be glad to receive mr gryce on my return and without further parley i took my bundles back from lena and proceeded at once to the carriage why should i show any failure of courage at an event that was but a repetition of the very ones which made my visit necessary was i a likely person to fall victim to a mystery to which my eyes had been opened had i not been sufficiently warned of the dangers of lost man's lane to keep myself at a respectable distance from the place of peril i was going to visit the children of my once devoted friend if there were perils of no ordinary nature to be encountered in so doing was i not all the more called upon to lend them the support of my presence yes mr gryce and nothing now should hold me back i even felt an increased desire to reach the scene of these mysteries and chafed some at the length of the journey which was of a more tedious character than i expected a poor beginning for events requiring patience as well as great moral courage but i little knew what was before me and only considered that every moment spent on this hot and dusty train kept me thus much longer from the embraces of althea's children i recovered my equanimity however as we approached x the scenery was really beautiful and the consciousness that i should soon alight at the mountain station which had played a more or less serious part in mr gryce's narrative awakened in me a pleasurable excitement which should have been a sufficient warning to me that the spirit of investigation which had led me so triumphantly through that affair next door had seized me again in a way that meant equal absorption if not equal success the number of small packages i carried gave me enough to think of at the moment of alighting but as soon as i was safely again on terra firma i threw a hasty glance around to see if any of althea's children were on hand to meet me i felt that i ought to know them at first glance their mother had been so characteristically pretty she could not have failed to transmit some of her most charming traits to her offspring 
but while there were two or three country maidens to be seen standing in and around the little pavilion known here as the mountain station i saw no one who by any stretch of imagination could be regarded as of althea burroughs blood or breeding somewhat disappointed for i had expected different results from my telegram i stepped up to the station master and asked him whether i would have any difficulty in procuring a carriage to take me to miss nolly's house he stared it seemed to me unnecessarily long before replying well said he simmons is usually here but i don't see him around to-day perhaps some of these farmer lads will drive you in but they all drew back with a scared look and I was beginning to tuck up my skirts preparatory to walking, when a little old man of exceedingly meek appearance drove up in a very old-fashioned coach, and with a hesitating air, springing entirely from bashfulness, managed to ask if I was Miss Butterworth. I hastened to assure him that I was that lady, whereupon he stammered out some words about Miss Knollys, and how sorry she was that she could not come for me herself. Then he pointed to his coach, and made me understand that I was to step into it and go with him. This I had not counted upon doing, for I desired to both see and hear as much as possible before reaching my destination. There was but one way out of it. To his astonishment, I insisted that my belongings be put inside the coach while I rode on the box. It was an inauspicious beginning to a very doubtful adventure. I understood this when I saw the heads of the various onlookers draw together and many curious looks directed at both us and the conveyance that was to carry us. But I was in no mood to be daunted now, and mounting to the box with what grace I could, prepared myself for a ride into town. But it seems I was not to be allowed to leave the spot without another warning. While the old man was engaged in fetching my trunk, the station-master approached me with great civility, and asked if it was my intention to spend a few days with the Mrs. Knollys. I told him that it was, and thinking it best to establish my position at once in the eyes of the whole town, added with a politeness equal to his own, that I was an old friend of the family, and had been coming to visit them for years, but had never found it convenient till now, and that I hoped they were all well and would be glad to see me. His reply showed considerable embarrassment. Perhaps you have not heard that this village is under a cloud just now. I have heard that one or two men have disappeared from here somewhat mysteriously, I returned. Is that what you mean? Yes, ma'am. One person, a boy, disappeared only two days ago. That's bad, I said. But what has it to do with me? I smilingly added, for I saw that he was not at the end of his talk oh nothing he eagerly replied only i didn't know but you might be timid oh i'm not at all timid i hastened to interject if i were i should not have come here at all such matters don't affect me and i spread out my skirts and arranged myself for my ride with as much care and precision as if the horrors he had mentioned had made no more impression upon me than if his chat had been of the weather perhaps i overdid it for he looked at me for another moment in a curious, lingering way. Then he walked off, and I saw him enter the circle of gossips on the platform, where he stood shaking his head as long as we were within sight. My companion, who was the shyest man I ever saw, did not speak a word while we were descending the hill. I talked and endeavoured to make him follow my example, but his replies were mere grunts or half-syllables which conveyed no information whatever. As we cleared the thicket, however, he allowed himself an ejaculation or two, as he pointed out the beauties of the landscape. And indeed it was well worth his admiration and mine, had my mind been free to enjoy it. But the houses, which now began to appear on either side of the way, drew my attention from the mountains. Though still somewhat remote from the town, we were rapidly approaching the head of that lane of evil fame, with whose awe-inspiring history my thoughts were at this time full. I was so anxious not to pass it without one look into its gruesome recesses, that I kept my head persistently turned that way, till I felt I was attracting the attention of my companion. 
as this was not desirable, I put on a nonchalant look and began chatting about what I saw. But he had lapsed into his early silence and seemed wholly engrossed in his attempt to remove with the butt-end of his whip a bit of rag which had somehow become entangled in the spokes of one of the front wheels. The furtive look he cast me as he succeeded in doing this struck me oddly at the moment, but it was too small a matter to hold my attention long, or to cause any cessation in the flow of small talk with which I was endeavouring to enliven the situation. My desire for conversation lagged, however, as I saw rising up before us the dark boughs of a pine thicket. We were nearing Lost Man's Lane. We were abreast of it. We were, yes, we were turning into it. I could not repress an exclamation of dismay. Where are we going? I asked. To Miss Nolly's house, he found words to say, with a sidelong glance at me full of uneasy inquiry. Do they live on this road? I cried, remembering with a certain shock Mr. Grice's suspicious description of the two young ladies who with their brother inhabited the dilapidated mansion marked A in the map he had shown me. Where else? was his laconic answer, and obliged to be satisfied with this curtest of curt replies, I drew myself up with just one longing look behind me at the cheerful highway we were so rapidly leaving. A cottage with an open window in which a child's head could be seen nodding eagerly toward me met my eyes and filled me with quite an odd sense of discomfort as I realised that I had caught the attention of one of the little cripples who, according to Mr. Grice, always kept watch over this entrance into Lost Man's Lane. Another moment and the pine branches had shut the vision out, but I did not soon forget that eager childish face and pointing hand, marking me out as a possible victim to the horrors of this ill-reputed lane. But I was aware of no secret flinching from the adventure into which I was plunging. On the contrary, I felt a strange and fierce delight in thus being thrust into the very heart of the mystery I had only expected to approach by degrees. The warning message sent me by Mr. Grice had acquired a deeper and more significant meaning, as did the looks which had been cast at me by the station-master and his gossips on the hillside. But in my present mood, these very tokens of the serious nature of my undertaking only gave an added spur to my courage. I felt my brain clear and my heart expand, as if at this moment, before I had so much as set eyes on the faces of these young people, I recognised the fact that they were the victims of a web of circumstances, so tragic and incomprehensible, that only a woman like myself would be able to dissipate them and restore these girls to the confidence of the people around them. I forgot that these girls had a brother, and that, but not a word to forestall the truth. I wish this story to grow upon you, just as it did upon me, and with just as little preparation. The farmer who drove me, and who I afterwards learned was called Simsbury, showed a certain dogged interest in my behaviour that would have amused me, or at least have awakened my disdain under circumstances of a less thrilling nature. I saw his eye roll in a sort of wonder over my person, which may have been held a little more stiffly than was necessary, and settle finally on my face, with a look I might have thought complimentary, had I had any thought to bestow on such matters. Not till we had passed the path branching up through the woods towards the mountain did he see fit to withdraw it nor did I fail to find it fixed again upon me as we rode by the little hut occupied by the old woman considered so harmless by Mr. Grice. Perhaps he had a reason for this, as I was very much interested in this hut and its occupant, about whom I felt free to cherish my own secret doubts, so interested that I cast it a very sharp glance and was glad when I caught a glimpse through the doorway of the old crone mumbling over a piece of bread she was engaged in eating as we passed her. "'That's Mother Jane,' explained my companion, breaking the silence of many minutes. "'And yonder is Miss Nolly's house. 
he added, lifting his whip and pointing toward the half-concealed façade of a large and pretentious dwelling, a few rods further on down the road. "'She will be powerful glad to see you, miss. Company is scarce in these parts.' Astonished at this sudden launch into conversation by one whose reserve I had hitherto found it impossible to penetrate, I gave him the affable answer he evidently expected, and then looked eagerly toward the house. It was, as Mr. Grice had intimated, exceedingly forbidding even at that distance, and as we approached nearer, and I was given a full view of its worn and discoloured front, I felt myself forced to acknowledge that never in my life had my eyes fallen upon a habitation more given over to neglect or less promising in its hospitality. Had it not been for the thin circle of smoke eddying up from one of its broken chimneys, I would have looked upon the place as one which had not known the care or presence of man for years. There was a riot of shrubbery in the yard, a lack of the commonest attention to order in the way the vines drooped in tangled masses over the face of the desolate porch, that gave to the broken pilasters and decayed window frames of this dreariest of facades that look of abandonment which only becomes picturesque when nature has usurped the prerogative of man and taken entirely to herself the empty walls and falling casements of what was once a human dwelling. That any one should be living in it now, and that I, who have never been able to see a chair standing crooked or a curtain awry without a sensation of the keenest discomfort, should be on the point of deliberately entering its doors as an inmate, filled me at the moment with such a sense of unreality that I descended from the carriage in a sort of dream, and was making my way through one of the gaps in the high antique fence that separated the yard from the gateway, when Mr. Simsbury stopped me and pointed out the gate. I did not think it worth while to apologise for my mistake, for the broken palings certainly offered as good an entrance as the gate, which had slipped from its hinges and hung but a few inches open. But I took the course he indicated, holding up my skirts and treading gingerly for fear of the snails and toads that encumbered such portions of the path as the weeds had left visible. As I proceeded on my way, something in the silence of the spot struck me. Was I becoming oversensitive to impressions? Or was there something really uncanny in the absolute lack of sound or movement in a dwelling of such dimensions? But I should not have said movement, for at that instant I saw a flash in one of the upper windows as of a curtain being stealthily drawn, and as stealthily let fall again, and though it gave me the promise of some sort of greeting, there was a furtiveness in the action, so in keeping with the suspicions of Mr. Grice, that I felt my nerves braced at once to mount the half-dozen uninviting-looking steps that led to the front door. But no sooner had I done this, with what I am fain to consider my best air, than I suddenly collapsed with what I am bound to regard as a comprehensible and quite excusable fear. For while I do not quail before men, and have a reasonable fortitude in the presence of most dangers, corporeal and moral, I am not quite myself in face of a rampant and barking dog. It is my one weakness, and while I usually can, and under most circumstances do, succeed in hiding my inner trepidation under the emergency just mentioned, I always feel that it would be a happy relief for me if the day should ever come when these so-called domestic animals would be banished from the affections and homes of men, then I think I would begin to live in good earnest, and perhaps enjoy trips into the country, which now, for all my apparent bravery, I regard more in the light of a penance than a pleasure. Imagine then how hard I found it to retain my self-possession, or even any appearance of dignity, when at the moment I was stretching forth my hand toward the knocker of this inhospitable mansion, I heard, rising from some unknown quarter, a howl so keen, piercing, and prolonged that it frightened the very birds over my head and sent them flying from the vines in clouds. 
it was the unhappiest kind of welcome for me i did not know whether it came from within or without and when after a moment of indecision i saw the door open i am not sure whether the smile i called up to grace the occasion had any of the real amelia butterworth in it so much was my mind divided between a desire to produce a favourable impression and a very decided and not to be hidden fear of the dog who had greeted my arrival with such an ominous howl call off the dog i cried almost before i saw what sort of person i was addressing mr gryce when i saw him later declared this to be the most significant introduction i could have made of myself upon entering the knollis mansion End of chapter 3 Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England Chapter 4 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England A Ghostly Interior the hall into which i had stepped was so dark that for a few minutes i could see nothing but the indistinct outline of a young woman with a very white face she had uttered some sort of murmur at my words but for some reason was strangely silent and if i could trust my eyes seemed rather to be looking back over her shoulder than into the face of her advancing guest this was odd but before i could quite satisfy myself as to the cause of her obstruction she suddenly bethought herself and throwing open the door of an adjoining room let in a stream of light by which we were enabled to see each other and exchange the greetings suitable to the occasion miss butterworth my mother's old friend she murmured with an almost pitiful effort to be cordial we are so glad to have you visit us won't you won't you sit down what did it mean she had pointed to a chair in the sitting-room but her face was turned away again as if drawn irresistibly towards some secret object of dread was there any one or anything at the top of the dim staircase i could faintly see in the distance it would not do for me to ask nor was it wise for me to show that i thought this reception a strange one stepping into the room she pointed out i waited for her to follow me which she did with manifest reluctance but when she was once out of the atmosphere of the hall or out of reach of the sight or sound of whatever it was that frightened her her face took on a smile that ingratiated her with me at once and gave to her very delicate aspect which up to that moment had not suggested the remotest likeness to her mother a piquant charm and subtle fascination that were not unworthy of the daughter of althea burroughs you must not mind the poverty of your welcome she said with a half proud half apologetic look around her which i must say the bareness and shabby character of the room we were in fully justified we have not been very well off since father died and mother left us had you given us a chance we should have written you that our home would not offer many inducements to you after your own but you have come unexpectedly and there there i put in for i saw that her embarrassment would soon get the better of her do not speak of it i did not come to enjoy your home but to see you are you the eldest my dear and where are your sister and brother i am not the eldest she said i am lucetta my sister here her head stole irresistibly back to its old position of listening will will come soon my brother is not in the house well said i astonished that she did not ask me to take off my things you are a pretty girl but you do not look very strong are you quite well my dear she started looked at me eagerly almost anxiously for a moment then straightened herself and began to lose some of her abstraction i am not a strong person she smiled but neither am i so very weak either i was always small so was my mother you know 
I was glad to have her talk of her mother. I therefore answered her in a way to prolong the conversation. Yes, your mother was small, I admitted, but never thin or pallid. She was like a fairy among us schoolgirls. Does it seem odd to hear so old a woman as I speak of herself as a schoolgirl? Oh, no, she said, but there was no heart in her voice. I had almost forgotten those days till I happened to hear the name of Althea mentioned the other day, I proceeded, seeing I must keep up the conversation if we were not to sit in total silence. Then my early friendship with your mother recurred to me, and I started up, as I always do when I come to any decision, my dear, and sent that telegram, which I hope I have not followed by an unwelcome presence. Oh, no, she repeated, but this time with some feeling. We need friends, and if you will overlook our shortcomings, but you have not taken off your hat. What will Laureen say to me? And with a sudden nervous action, as marked as her late listlessness, she jumped up and began busying herself over me, untying my bonnet and laying aside my bundles, which up to this moment I had held in my hands. I, I am so absent-minded, she murmured. I, I did not think. I hope you will excuse me. Laureen would have given you a much better welcome. Then Laureen should have been here, I said with a smile. I could not restrain this slight rebuke, yet I liked the girl, notwithstanding everything I had heard, and her own odd and unaccountable behaviour, there was a sweetness in her face, when she chose to smile, that proved an irresistible attraction. And then, for all her absent-mindedness and abstracted ways, she was such a lady. Her plain dress, her restrained manner, could not hide this fact. It was apparent in every line of her thin but graceful form, and in every inflection of her musical but constrained voice. Had I seen her in my own parlour, instead of between these bare and mouldering walls, I should have said the same thing. She is such a lady. But this only passed through my mind at the time. I was not studying her personality but trying to understand why my presence in the house had so visibly disturbed her. Was it the embarrassment of poverty, not knowing how to meet the call made so suddenly upon it? I hardly thought so. Fear would not enter into a sensation of this kind, and fear was what I had seen in her face before the front door had closed upon me. But that fear, was it connected with me? or with something threatening her from another portion of the house. The latter supposition seemed the probable one. The way her ear was turned, the slight start she gave at every sound, convinced me that her cause of dread lay elsewhere than with myself, and therefore was worthy of my closest attention. Though I chatted and tried in every way to arouse her confidence, I could not help asking myself between the sentences if the cause of her apprehension lay with her sister, her brother, or in something entirely apart from either, and connected with the dreadful matter which had drawn me to X. Or another supposition still, was it merely the sign of an habitual distemper, which, misunderstood by Mr. Grice, had given rise to the suspicions which it was my possible mission here to dispel. Anxious to force things a little, I remarked with a glance at the dismal branches that almost forced their way into the open casements, What a scene for young eyes like yours! Do you never get tired of these pine boughs and clustering shadows? Would not a little cottage in the sunnier part of the town be preferable to all this dreary grandeur? She looked up with sudden wistfulness that made her smile piteous. Some of my happiest days have been passed here, and some of my saddest. I do not think I should like to leave it for any sunny cottage. We were not made for bonny homes, she continued. The sombreness of this old house suits us. And of this road, I ventured, it is the darkest and most picturesque i ever rode through i thought i was threading a wilderness for a moment she forgot her cause of anxiety 
and looked at me quite intently while a subtle shade of doubt passed slowly over her features it is a solitary one she acquiesced i do not wonder it struck you as dismal have you heard has any one ever told you that that it was not considered quite safe safe i repeated with god forgive me an expression of mild wonder in my eyes yes it has not the best of reputations strange things have happened in it i thought that someone might have been kind enough to tell you this at the station there was a gentle sort of sarcasm in the tone only that or so it seemed to me at the time i began to feel myself in a maze somebody i suppose it was the station master did say something to me about a boy lost somewhere in this portion of the woods do you mean that my dear she nodded glancing again over her shoulder and partly rising as if moved by some instinct of flight they are dark enough for more than one person to have been lost in their recesses i observed with another look toward the heavily curtained windows they certainly are she assented reseating herself and eyeing me nervously while she spoke we are used to the terrors they inspire in strangers but if you she leaped to her feet in manifest eagerness and her whole face changed in a way she little realized herself if you have any fear of sleeping amid such gloomy surroundings we can procure you a room in the village where you will be more comfortable and where we can visit you almost as well as we can here shall i do it shall i call my face must have assumed a very grim look for her words tripped at that point and a flush the first i had seen on her cheek suffused her face giving her an appearance of great distress oh i wish laureen would come i am not at all happy in my suggestions she said with a deprecatory twitch of her lip that was one of her subtle charms oh there she is now i may go she cried and without the least appearance of realizing that she had said anything out of place she rushed from the room almost before her sister had entered it but not before their eyes had met in a look of unusual significance. End of chapter 4 Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England Chapter 5 of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Mary Bard, Derby, England a strange household had i not surprised this look of mutual understanding i might have received an impression of miss knollys which would in a measure have counteracted that made by the more nervous and less restrained lucetta the dignified reserve of her bearing the quiet way in which she approached and above all the even tones in which she uttered her welcome were such as to win my confidence and put me at my ease in the house of which she was the nominal mistress but that look with that in my memory i was enabled to pierce below the surface of this placid nature and in the very constraint she put upon herself detect the presence of the same secret uneasiness which had been so openly if unconsciously manifested by her sister she was more beautiful than lucetta in form and feature and even more markedly elegant in her plain black gown and fine lawn ruffles but she lacked her sister's evanescent charm and though admirable to all appearance was less lovable on a short acquaintance but this delays my tale which is one of action rather than reflection i had naturally expected that with the appearance of the elder miss knollys i should be taken to my room but on the contrary she sat down and with an apologetic air informed me that she was sorry she could not show me the customary attentions circumstances over which she had no control had made it impossible she said for her to offer me the guest chamber but if i would be so good as to accept another for this one night she would endeavour to provide me with better accommodations on the morrow 
satisfied of the almost painful nature of their poverty and determined to submit to privations rather than leave a house so imbued with mystery i hastened to assure her that any room would be acceptable to me and with a display of good feeling not wholly insincere began to gather up my wraps in anticipation of being taken at once upstairs but miss knollys again surprised me by saying that my room was not yet ready that they had not been able to complete all their arrangements and begged me to make myself at home in the room where i was till evening as this was asking a good deal of a woman of my years fresh from a railroad journey and with natural habits of great neatness and order i felt somewhat disconcerted but hiding my feelings in consideration of reasons before given replaced my bundles on the table and endeavoured to make the best of a somewhat trying situation launching at once into conversation i began as with lucetta to talk about her mother i had never known save in the vaguest way why mrs knollys had taken the journey which had ended in her death and burial in a foreign land rumour had it that she had gone abroad for her health which had begun to fail after the birth of lucetta but as rumour had not added why she had gone unaccompanied by her husband or children there remained much which these girls might willingly tell me which would be of the greatest interest to me but miss knollys intentionally or unintentionally assumed an air so cold at my well-meant questions that i desisted from pressing them and began to talk about myself in a way which i hoped would establish really friendly relations between us and make it possible for her to tell me later if not at the present moment what it was that weighed so heavily upon the household that no one could enter this home without feeling the shadow of the secret terror enveloping it but miss knollys while more attentive to my remarks than her sister had been showed by certain unmistakable signs that her heart and interest were anywhere but in that room and while i could not regard this as throwing any discredit upon my powers of pleasing which have rarely failed when i have exerted them to their utmost i still could not but experience the dampening effect of her manner i went on chatting but in a desultory way noting all that was odd in her unaccountable reception of me but giving as i firmly believe no evidence of my concern and rapidly increasing curiosity the peculiarities observable in this my first interview with these interesting but by no means easily to be understood sisters continued all day when one sister came in the other stepped out and when dinner was announced and i was ushered down the bare and dismal hall into an equally bare and unattractive dining-room it was to find the chairs set for four and lucetta only seated at the table where is laureen i asked wonderingly as i took the seat she pointed out to me with one of her faint and quickly vanishing smiles she cannot come at present my young hostess stammered with an unmistakable glance of distress at the large hearty-looking woman who had summoned me to the dining-room ah i ejaculated thinking that possibly laureen had found it necessary to assist in the preparation of the meal and your brother it was the first time he had been mentioned since my first inquiries i had shrunk from the venture out of a motive of pure compassion and they had not seen fit to introduce his name into any of our conversations consequently i awaited her response with some anxiety having a secret premonition that in some way he was at the bottom of my strange reception her hasty answer given however without any increase of embarrassment somewhat dispelled this supposition oh he will be in presently said she william is never very punctual but when he did come in i could not help seeing that her manner instantly changed and became almost painfully anxious though it was my first meeting with the real head of the house she waited for an interchange of looks with him before giving me the necessary introduction and when this duty performed he took his seat at the table her thoughts and attention remained so fixed upon him 
that she well nigh forgot the ordinary civilities of a hostess had it not been for the woman i have spoken of who in her good-natured attention to my wants amply made up for the abstraction of her mistress i should have fared ill at this meal good and ample as it was considering the resources of those who provided it she seemed to dread to have him speak almost to have him move she watched him with her lips half open ready as it appeared to stop any inadvertent expression he might utter in his efforts to be agreeable she even kept her left hand disengaged with the evident intention of stretching it out in his direction if in his lumbering stupidity he should utter a sentence calculated to open my eyes to what she so passionately desired to have kept secret i saw it all as plainly as i saw his heavy indifference to her anxiety and knowing from experience that it is in just such stolid louts as these that the worst passions are often hidden i took advantage of my years and forced a conversation in which i hoped some flash of his real self would appear despite her wary watch upon him not liking to renew the topic of the lane itself i asked with a very natural show of interest who was their nearest neighbour it was william who looked up and william who answered old mother jane is the nearest said he but she's no good we never think of her mr trome is the only neighbour i care for such peaches as the old fellow raises such grapes such melons he gave me two of the nicest you ever saw this morning by jupiter i taste them yet lucetta's face which should have crimsoned with mortification turned most unaccountably pale yet not so pale as it had previously done when a few minutes before he began to say lorene wants some of this soup saved for and stopped awkwardly conscious perhaps that lorene's wants should not be mentioned before me i thought you promised me that you would never again ask mr trome for any of his fruit remonstrated lucetta oh i didn't ask i just stood at the fence and looked over mr trome and i are good friends why shouldn't i eat his fruit the look she gave him might have moved a stone but he seemed perfectly impervious to it seeing him so stolid her head drooped and she did not answer a word yet somehow i felt that even while she was so manifestly a prey to the deepest mortification her attention was not wholly given over to this one emotion there was something else she feared hoping to relieve her and lighten the situation i forced myself to smile on the young man as i said why don't you raise melons yourself i think if i possessed your land i should be anxious to raise everything i could on it oh you're a woman he retorted almost roughly it's good business for women and for men too perhaps who love to see fruit hang but i only care to eat it don't lucetta put in but not with the vigour i had expected i like to hunt train dogs and enjoy other people's fruit he laughed with a nod at the blushing lucetta i don't see any use in a man's putting himself out for things he can get for the asking life's too short for such folly i mean to have a good time while i'm on this blessed sphere william the cry was irresistible yet it was not the cry i had been looking for painful as was this exhibition of his stupidity and utter want of feeling it was not the one thing she stood in dread of or why was her protest so much weaker than her appearance had given token of oh he shouted in great amusement while she shrunk back with a horrified look lucetta don't like to hear me say that she thinks a man ought to work plough harrow dig make a slave of himself to keep up a place that's no good anyway but i tell her that work is something she'll never get out of me i was born a gentleman and a gentleman i will live if the place tumbles down over our heads perhaps it would be the best way to get rid of it then i could go live with mr trome and have melons from early morn till late at night and again his coarse laugh rang out this or was it his words seemed to rouse her as nothing had done before 
thrusting out her hand she laid it on his mouth with a look of almost frenzied appeal at the woman who was standing at his back mr william how can you that woman protested and when he would have turned upon her angrily she leaned over and whispered in his ear a few words that seemed to cow him for he gave a short grunt through his sister's trembling fingers and with a shrug of his heavy shoulders subsided into silence to all this i was a simple spectator but i did not soon forget a single feature of the scene the remainder of the dinner passed quietly william and myself eating with more or less heartiness lucetta tasting nothing at all in mercy to her i declined coffee and as soon as william gave token of being satisfied we hurriedly rose it was the most uncomfortable meal i ever ate in my life end of chapter 5 recording by mary bard derby england chapter 6 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain a somber evening the evening like the afternoon was spent in the sitting room with one of the sisters one event alone is worth recording i had become excessively tired of a conversation that always languished no matter on what topic it started and observing an old piano in one corner i once played very well i sat down before it and impulsively struck a few chords from the yellow keys instantly lucetta it was lucetta who was with me then bounded to my side with a look of horror don't do that she cried laying her hand on mine to stop me then seeing my look of dignified astonishment she added with an appealing smile i beg pardon but every sound goes through me to-night are you not well i asked i am never very well she returned and we went back to the sofa and renewed our forced and pitiful attempts at conversation promptly at nine o'clock miss knollys came in she was very pale and cast as usual a sad and uneasy look at her sister before she spoke to me immediately lucetta rose and becoming very pale herself was hurrying toward the door when her sister stopped her you have forgotten she said to say good-night to our guest instantly lucetta turned and with a sudden uncontrollable impulse seized my hand and pressed it convulsively good-night she cried i hope you will sleep well and was gone before i could say a word in response why does lucetta go out of the room when you come in i asked determined to know the reason for this peculiar conduct have you any other guests in the house the reply came with unexpected vehemence no she cried why should you think so there is no one here but the family and she turned away with a dignity she must have inherited from her father for althea burroughs had every interesting quality but that you must be very tired she remarked if you please we will go now to your room i rose at once glad of the prospect of seeing the upper portion of the house she took my wraps on her arm and we passed immediately into the hall as we did so i heard voices one of them shrill and full of distress but the sound was so quickly smothered by a closing door that I failed to discover whether this tone of suffering proceeded from a man or a woman. Miss Knollys, who was preceding me, glanced back in some alarm, but as I gave no token of having noticed anything out of the ordinary, she speedily resumed her way upstairs. As the sounds I had heard proceeded from above, I followed her with alacrity, but felt my enthusiasm diminish somewhat when I found myself passing door after door down a long hall to a room as remote as possible from what seemed to be the living portion of the house. "'Is it necessary to put me off quite so far?' I asked, as my young hostess paused and waited for me to join her on the threshold of the most forbidding room it had ever been my fortune to enter. The blush which mounted to her brow showed that she felt the situation keenly. 
I am sure, she said, that it is a matter of great regret to me to be obliged to offer you so mean a lodging, but all our other rooms are out of order, and I cannot accommodate you with anything better to-night. But isn't there some spot nearer you? I urged. A couch in the same room with you would be more acceptable to me than this distant room. I, I hope you are not timid, she began, but I hastened to disabuse her mind on this score. I am not afraid of any earthly thing but dogs, I protested warmly, but I do not like solitude. I came here for companionship, my dear. I really would like to sleep with one of you. This to see how she would meet such urgency. She met it, as I might have known she would, by a rebuff. I am very sorry, she again repeated, but it is quite impossible. If I could give you the comforts you are accustomed to, I should be glad. But we are unfortunate, we girls, and... She said no more, but began to busy herself about the room, which held but one object that had the least look of comfort in it. That was my trunk, which had been neatly placed in one corner. I suppose you are not used to candles, she remarked, lighting what struck me as a very short end from the one she held in her hand. My dear, said I, I can accommodate myself to much that I am not used to. I have very few old maid's ways or notions. You shall see that I am far from being a difficult guest. She heaved a sigh, and then, seeing my eye travelling slowly over the grey discoloured walls, which were not relieved by so much as a solitary print, she pointed to a bell-rope near the head of the bed, and considerately remarked, if you wish anything in the night, or are disturbed in any way, pull that. It communicates with my room, and I will be only too glad to come to you. I glanced up at the rope, ran my eye along the wire communicating with it, and saw that it was broken sheer off before it even entered into the wall. I am afraid you will not hear me, I answered, pointing to the break. She flushed a deep scarlet and for a moment looked as embarrassed as ever her sister had done. "'I did not know,' she murmured. "'The house is so old. Everything is more or less out of repair.' And she made haste to quit the room. I stepped after her in grim determination. "'But there is no key to the door,' I objected. She came back with a look that was as nearly desperate as her placid features were capable of. I know, she said, I know, we have nothing. But if you are not afraid, and of what could you be afraid in this house, under our protection and with a good dog outside, you will bear with things to-night, and, good God, she murmured, but not so low, but that my excited sense caught every syllable. Can she have heard? Has the reputation of this place gone abroad? "'Miss Butterworth,' she repeated earnestly, "'the house contains no cause of terror for you. "'Nothing threatens our guest, "'nor need you have the least concern for yourself or us, "'whether the night passes in quiet "'or whether it is broken by unaccountable sounds. "'They will have no reference to anything in which you are interested.' "'Aha!' thought I. "'Won't they?' You give me credit for much indifference, my dear. But I said nothing beyond a few soothing phrases, which I made purposely short, seeing that every moment I detained her was just so much unnecessary torture to her. Then I went back to my room and carefully closed the door. My first night in this dismal and strangely ordered house had opened anything but propitiously. End of chapter 6
and at home occupy my second floor alone without the least apprehension but there is a difference in these two abiding places as i think you are ready by this time to acknowledge and though i felt little of what is called fear i certainly did not experience my usual satisfaction in the minute preparations with which i am accustomed to make myself comfortable for the night there was a gloom both within and without the four bare walls between which i now found myself shut which i would have been something less than human not to feel and though i had no dread of being overcome by it i was glad to add something to the cheer of the spot by opening my trunk and taking out a few of those little matters of personal equipment without which the brightest room looks barren and a den like this too desolate for habitation then i took a good look about me to see how i could obtain for myself some sense of security the bed was light and could be pulled in front of the door this was something there was but one window and that was closely draped with some thick dark stuff very funereal in its appearance going to it i pulled aside the thick folds and looked out a mass of heavy foliage at once met my eye obstructing the view of the sky and adding much to the lonesomeness of the situation i let the curtain fall again and sat down in a chair to think the shortness of the candle end with which i had been provided had struck me as significant so significant that i had not allowed it to burn long after miss knollys had left me if these girls charming no doubt but sly had thought to shorten my watch by shortening my candle i would give them no cause to think but that their ruse had been successful the foresight which causes me to add a winter wrap to my stock of clothing even when the weather is at the hottest leads me to place a half dozen or so of candles in my travelling trunk and so i had only to open a little oblong box in the upper tray to have the means at my disposal of keeping a light all night so far so good i had a light but had i anything else in case william knollys but with this thought miss knollys's look and reassuring words recurred to me whatever you may hear if you hear anything will have no reference to yourself and need not disturb you this was comforting certainly from a selfish standpoint but did it relieve my mind concerning others not knowing what to think of it all and fully conscious that sleep would not visit me under existing circumstances i finally made up my mind not to lie down till better assured that sleep on my part would be desirable so after making the various little arrangements already alluded to i drew over my shoulders a comfortable shawl and set myself to listen for what i feared would be more than one dreary hour of this not to be envied night and here just let me stop to mention that carefully considered as all my precautions were i had forgotten one thing upon leaving home which at this minute made me very nearly miserable i had not included among my effects the alcohol lamp and all the other private and particular conveniences which i possess for making tea in my own apartment had i but had them with me and had i been able to make and sip a cup of my own delicious tea through the ordeal of listening for whatever sounds might come to disturb the midnight stillness of this house what relief it would have been to my spirits and in what a different light i might have regarded mr gryce and the mission with which i had been entrusted but i not only lacked this element of comfort but the satisfaction of thinking that it was any one's fault but my own lena had laid her hand on that teapot but i had shaken my head fearing that the sight of it might offend the eyes of my young hostesses but i had not calculated upon being put in a remote corner like this of a house large enough to accommodate a dozen families and if ever i travel again but this is a matter personal to amelia butterworth and of no interest to you i will not inflict my little foibles upon you again eleven o'clock came and went 
I had heard no sound. Twelve, and I began to think that all was not quite so still as before, that I certainly could hear now and then faint noises, as of a door creaking on its hinges, or the smothered sound of stealthily moving feet. Yet all was so far from being distinct, that for some time I hesitated to acknowledge to myself that anything could be going on in the house, which was not to be looked for in a home professing to be simply the abode of a decent young man and two very quiet-appearing young ladies. And even after the noises and whispering had increased to such an extent that I could even distinguish the sullen tones of the brother from the softer and more carefully modulated accents of Lucetta and her sister, I found myself ready to explain the matter by any conjecture short of that which involved these delicate young ladies in any scheme of secret wickedness. But when I found there was likely to be no diminution in the various noises and movements that were taking place in the front of the house, and that only something much out of the ordinary could account for so much disturbance in a country home so long after midnight, I decided that only a person insensible to all sight and sound could be expected to remain asleep under such circumstances, and that I would be perfectly justified in their eyes in opening my door and taking a peep down the corridor. So without further ado, I drew my bed aside and glanced out. All was perfectly dark and silent in the great house. The only light visible came from the candle burning in the room behind me, and as for sound, it was almost too still. It was the stillness of intent, rather than that of natural repose. This was so unexpected, that for an instant I stood baffled and wondering. Then my nose went up, and I laughed quietly to myself. I could see nothing, and I could hear nothing. But Amelia Butterworth, like most of her kind, boasts of more than two senses, and happily there was something to smell. A quickly blown-out candle leaves a witness behind it to sensitive nostrils like mine, and this witness assured me that the darkness was deceptive. Someone had just passed the head of my corridor with a light, and because the light was extinguished, it did not follow that the person who held it was far away. Indeed, I thought that now I heard a palpitating breath. Hm! I cried aloud, but as if in unconscious communion with myself. It is not often I have so vivid a dream. I was sure that I heard steps in the hall. I fear I am growing nervous. Nothing moved. No one answered me. "'Miss Knollys,' I called firmly. "'No reply. "'Lucetta, dear!' "'I thought this appeal would go unanswered also, "'but when I raised my voice for the third time, "'a sudden rushing sound took place down the corridor, "'and Lucetta's excited figure, fully dressed, "'appeared in the faint circle of light "'caused by my now rapidly waning candle. "'Miss Butterworth, what is the matter?' she asked making as if she would draw me into my room, a proceeding which I took good care she should not succeed in. Giving a glance at her dress, which was the same she had worn at the supper-table, I laughingly retorted, "'Isn't that a question I might better ask you? It is two o'clock by my watch, and you, for all your apparent delicacy, are still up. What does it mean, my dear?' Have I put you out so completely by my coming that none of you can sleep? Her eyes, which had fallen before mine, quickly looked up. I am sorry, she began, flushing, and trying to take a peep into my room, possibly to see if I had been to bed. We did not mean to disturb you, but, but, oh, Miss Butterworth, pray excuse our makeshifts and our poverty. We wished to fix up another room for you, and were ashamed to have you see how little we had to do it with. So we were moving some things out of our own room tonight, and here her voice broke, and she burst into an almost uncontrollable flood of tears. Don't, she entreated, don't, as quite 
thoroughly ashamed i began to utter some excuses i shall be all right in a moment i am used to humiliations only and her whole body seemed to join in the plea it trembled so do not i pray speak quite so loud my brother is more sensitive than even Laureen and myself about these things and if he should hear hear a suppressed oath from way down the hall assured me that he did hear but i gave no sign of my recognition of this fact and lucetta added quickly he would not forgive us for our carelessness in waking you he is rough sometimes but so good at heart so good this with the other small matter i have just mentioned caused a revulsion in my feelings he good i did not believe it yet her eyes showed no wavering when i interrogated them with mine and feeling that i had perhaps been doing them all an injustice and that what i had seen was as she evidently meant to intimate due to their efforts to make a sudden guest comfortable amid their poverty i put the best face i could on the matter and gave the poor pitiful pleading face a kiss i was startled to feel how cold her forehead was and more and more concerned loaded her down with such assurances of appreciation as came to my lips and sent her back to her own room with an injunction not to trouble herself any more about fixing up any other room for me only i added as her whole face showed relief we will go to the locksmith to-morrow and get a key and after to-night you will be kind enough to see that i have a cup of tea brought to my room just before i retire i am no good without my cup of tea my dear what keeps other people awake makes me sleep oh you shall have your tea she cried with an eagerness that was almost unnatural and then slipping from my grasp she uttered another hasty apology for having roused me from my sleep and ran hastily back i stretched out my arm for the candle guttering in my room and held it up to light her she seemed to shrink at sight of its rays and the last vision i had of her speeding figure showed me that same look of dread on her pallid features which had aroused my interest in our first interview she may have explained why the three of them are up at this time of night i muttered but she has not explained why her every conversation is seasoned by an expression of fear and thus brooding i went back to my room and pushing the bed again against the door lay down upon it and out of sheer chagrin fell fast asleep end of chapter seven chapter eight of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain on the stairs i did not wake up till morning the room was so dark that in all probability i should not have wakened then if my habits of exact punctuality had not been aided by a gentle knock at my door who's there i called for i could not say come in till i had moved my bed and made way for the door to open hannah with warm water replied a voice at which i made haste to rise hannah was the woman who had waited on us at dinner the sight of her pleasant countenance which nevertheless looked a trifle haggard was a welcome relief after the sombre features of the night addressing her with my usual brusqueness but with quite my usual kindness i asked how the young ladies were feeling this morning her answer made a great show of frankness oh they are much as usual said she miss laureen is in the kitchen and miss lucetta will soon be here to inquire how you are i hope you passed a good night yourself ma'am i had slept more than i ought to perhaps and made haste to reassure her as to my own condition then seeing that a little talk would not be unwelcome to this hearty woman tired to death possibly with life in this dreary house i made some excuse for keeping her a few minutes saying as i did so what an immense dwelling this is for four persons to live in or have you another inmate whom i have not seen i thought her buxom colour showed a momentary sign of failing 
but it all came back with her answer which was given in a round hearty voice oh i'm the only maid ma'am i cook and sweep and all i couldn't abide another near me even mr simsbury who tends the cow and horse and who only comes in for his dinner worries me by spells i like to have my own way in the kitchen except when the young ladies choose to come in is there anything you want ma'am and do you prefer tea or coffee for breakfast i told her that i always drank coffee in the morning and would have liked to have added a question or two but she gave me no chance as she went out i saw her glance at my candlestick there was only a half burned end in it she is calculating too how long i sat up thought i lucetta stood at the head of the stairs as i went down will you excuse me for a few moments said she i am not quite ready to follow you but will be soon i will take a look at the grounds i thought she hesitated for a moment then her face lighted up be sure you don't encounter the dog she cried and slipped hastily down a side hall i had not noticed the night before ah a good way to keep me in i reasoned but i shall see the grounds yet if i have to poison that dog notwithstanding i made no haste to leave the house i don't believe in tempting providence especially where a dog is concerned instead of that i stood still and looked up and down the halls endeavouring to get some idea of their plan and of the location of my own room in reference to the rest i found that the main hall ran at right angles to the long corridor down which i had just come and noting that the doors opening into it were of a size and finish vastly superior to those i had passed in the corridor just mentioned i judged that the best bedrooms all lay front and that i had been quartered at the end of what had once been considered as the servants hall at my right as i looked down the stairs ran a wall with a break which looked like an opening into another corridor and indeed i afterward learned that the long series of rooms of which mine was the last had its counterpart on the other side of this enormous dwelling giving to the house the shape of a long square u i was looking in some wonderment at this opening and marvelling over the extravagant hospitality of those old days which necessitated such a number of rooms in a private gentleman's home when i heard a door open and two voices speaking one was rough and careless unmistakably that of william knollys the other was slow and timid and was just as unmistakably that of the man who had driven me to this house the day before they were talking of some elderly person and i had good sense enough not to allow my indignation to blind me to the fact that by that elderly person they meant me this is important for their words were not without significance how shall we keep the old girl out of the house till it's all over was what i heard from william's surly lips lucetta has a plan was the hardly distinguishable answer i am to take that was all i could hear a closing door shut off the remainder something then was going on in this house of a dark if not mysterious character and the attempts made by these two interesting and devoted girls to cover up the fact by explanations founded on their poverty had been but subterfuges after all grieved on their account but inwardly grateful to the imprudence of their more than reckless brother for this not to be mistaken glimpse into the truth i slowly descended the stairs in that state of complete self-possession which is given by a secret knowledge of the intentions formed against us by those whose actions we have reason to suspect henceforth i had but one duty to penetrate the mystery of this household whether it was the one suspected by mr gryce or another of a less evil and dangerous character hardly mattered in my eyes while the blight of it rested upon this family eyes would be lowered and heads shaken at their name this if i could help it must no longer be if guilt lay at the bottom of all this fear then this guilt must be known 
if innocence i thought of the brother's lowering brow and felt it incompatible with innocence but remembering mr gryce's remarks on this subject read an instant lecture to myself and putting all conclusions aside devoted the few minutes in which i found myself alone in the dining-room to a careful preparation of my mind for its duty which was not likely to be of the simplest character if lucetta's keen wits were to be pitted against mine end of chapter eight chapter nine of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain a new acquaintance when my mind is set free from doubt and fully settled upon any course i am capable of much good nature and seeming simplicity i was therefore able to maintain my own at the breakfast table with some success so that the meal passed off without any of the disagreeable experiences of the night before perhaps the fact that laureen presided at the coffee urn instead of lucetta had something to do with this her calm even looks seemed to put some restraint upon the boisterous outbursts to which william was only too liable while her less excitable nature suffered less if by any chance he did break out and startle the decorous silence by one of his rude guffaws i am a slow eater but i felt forced to hurry through the meal or be left eating alone at the end this did not put me in the best of humour for i hated to risk an indigestion just when my faculties needed to be unusually alert i compromised by leaving the board hungry but i did it with such a smile that i do not think miss knollys knew i had not risen from any table so ill satisfied in years i will leave you to my brother for a few minutes said she hastily tripping from the room i pray that you will not think of going to your room till we have had an opportunity of arranging it i instantly made up my mind to disobey this injunction but first it was necessary to see what i could make of william he was not a very promising subject as he turned and led the way toward the front of the house i thought you might like to see the grounds he growled evidently not enjoying the role assigned him they are so attractive he sneered children hereabout call them the jungle who's to blame for that i asked with only a partial humouring of his ill nature you have a sturdy pair of arms of your own and a little trimming here and a little trimming there would have given quite a different appearance to this undergrowth a gentleman usually takes pride in his place yes when it's all his this belongs to my sisters as much as to me what's the use of my bothering myself about it the man was so selfish he did not realize the extent of the exhibition he made of it indeed he seemed to take pride in what he probably called his independence i began to feel the most intense aversion for him and only with the greatest difficulty could prolong this conversation unmoved i should think it would be a pleasure to give that much assistance to your sisters they do not seem to be sparing in their attempts to please you he snapped his fingers and i was afraid a dog or two would come leaping around the corner of the house but it was only his way of expressing disdain oh the girls are well enough he grumbled but they will stick to the place lucetta might have married a half dozen times and once i thought she was going to but suddenly she turned straight about and sent her lover packing and that made me mad beyond everything why should she hang on to me like a burr when there are other folks willing to take on the burden it was the most palpable display of egotism i had ever seen and one of the most revolting i was so disgusted by it that i spoke up without any too much caution perhaps she thinks she can be useful to you i said i have known sisters give up their own happiness on no better grounds useful he sneered it's a usefulness a man like me can dispense with do you know what i would like we were standing in one of the tangled pathways with our faces turned toward the house 
as he spoke he looked up and made a rude sort of gesture toward the blank expanse of empty and curtainless windows i would like that great house all to myself to make into one huge bachelor's hall i should like to feel that i could tramp from one end of it to the other without awakening an echo i did not choose to hear there i should not find it too big i should not find it too lonesome i and my dogs would know how to fill it wouldn't we saracen oh i forgot saracen is locked up the way he mumbled the last sentence showed displeasure but i gave little heed to that the gloating way in which he said he and his dogs would fill it had given me a sort of turn i began to have more than an aversion for the man he inspired me with something like terror your wishes said i with as little expression as possible seem to leave your sisters entirely out of your calculations how would your mother regard that if she could see you from the place where she is gone he turned upon me with a look of anger that made his features positively ugly what do you mean by speaking to me of my mother have i spoken of her to you is there any reason why you should lug my mother into this conversation if so say so and be he did not swear at me he did not dare to but he came precious near to it and that was enough to make me recoil she was my friend said i i knew and loved her before you were born that was why i spoke of her and i think it very natural myself he seemed to feel ashamed he grumbled out some sort of apology and looked about quite helplessly possibly for the dog he manifestly was in the habit of seeing forever at his heels i took advantage of this momentary abstraction on his part to smooth my own disturbed features she was a beautiful girl i remarked on the principle that the ice once broken one should not hesitate about jumping in was your father equally handsome for a man my father yes let's talk of father he was a judge of horses he was when he died there were three mares in the stable not to be beat this side of albany but those devils of executors sold them and i well you had a chance to test the speed of old bess yesterday you weren't afraid of being thrown out i take it great scott to think of a man of my tastes owning no other horse than that you have not answered my question i suggested turning him about and moving toward the gate oh about the way my father looked what does that matter he was handsome though folks say that i get whatever good looks i have from him he was big bigger than i am and while he lived what did you make a fellow talk for i don't know why i did but i was certainly astonished at the result this great huge lump of selfish clay had actually shown feeling and was ashamed of it like the lout he was yesterday said i anxious to change the subject i had difficulty in getting in through that gate we are pointing for couldn't you set it straight with just a little effort he paused looked at me to see if i were in earnest then took a dogged step toward the gate i was still indicating with my resolute right hand but before he could touch it he perceived something on that deserted and ominous highway which made him start in sudden surprise why trome he cried is that you well it's an age since i have seen you turn that corner on a visit to us some time certainly answered a hearty and pleasant voice and before i could quite drop the look of severity with which i was endeavouring to shame this young man into some decent show of interest in this place and assume the more becoming aspect of a lady caught unawares at an early morning hour plucking flowers from a stunted syringa a gentleman stepped into sight on the other side of the fence with a look and a bow so genial and devoid of mystery that i experienced for the first time since entering the gloomy precincts of this town a decided sensation of pleasure miss butterworth explained mr knollys with a somewhat forced gesture in my direction a guest of my sister's he went on and looked as if he hoped i would retire though he made no motion to welcome mr trome in 
but rather leaned a little conspicuously on the gate as if anxious to show that he had no idea that the other's intention went any further than the passing of a few neighbourly comments at the gate i like to please the young even when they are no more agreeable than my surly host and if the gentleman who had just shown himself had been equally immature i would certainly have left them to have their talk out undisturbed but he was not he was older he was even of sufficient years for his judgment to have become thoroughly matured and his every faculty developed i therefore could not see why my society should be considered an intrusion by him so i waited his next sentence was addressed to me i am happy said he to have the pleasure of a personal introduction to miss butterworth i did not expect it the surprise is all the more agreeable I only anticipated being allowed to leave this package and letter with the maid. They are addressed to you, madam, and were left at my house by mistake. I could not hide my astonishment. I live in the next house below, said he. The boy who brought these from the post office was a stupid lad, and I could not induce him to come any further up the road. I hope you will excuse the present messenger, and believe there has been no delay. I bowed with what must have seemed an abstracted politeness. The letter was from New York, and, as I strongly suspected, from Mr. Grice. Somehow this fact created in me an unmistakable embarrassment. I put both letter and package into my pocket, and endeavoured to meet the gentleman's eye with my accustomed ease in the presence of strangers. But, strange to say, I had no sooner done so then I saw that he was no more at his ease than myself. He smiled, glanced at William, made an off-hand remark or so about the weather, but he could not deceive eyes sharpened by such experience as mine. Something disturbed him, something connected with me. It made my cheek a little hot to acknowledge this even to myself, but it was so very evident that I began to cast about for the means of ridding ourselves of William when that blundering youth suddenly spoke. I suppose he was afraid to come up the lane. Do you know I think you're brave to attempt it, Trome? We haven't a very good name here. And with a sudden, perfectly unnatural burst, he broke out into one of his huge guffaws that so shook the old gate on which he was leaning that I thought it would tumble down with him before our eyes. I saw Mr. Trome start, and cast him a look in which I seemed to detect both surprise and horror, before he turned to me, and with an air of polite deprecation, anxiously said, I am afraid Miss Butterworth will not understand your allusions, Mr. Knollys. I hear this is her first visit in town. As his manner showed even more feeling than the occasion seemed to warrant, I made haste to answer that I was well acquainted with the tradition of the lane, that its name alone showed what had happened here. His bearing betrayed an instant relief. I am glad to find you so well informed, said he. I was afraid, here he cast another very strange glance at William, that your young friends might have shrunk from some sense of delicacy from telling you what might frighten most guests from a lonely road like this. I compliment you upon their thoughtfulness. William bowed, as if the words of the other contained no other suggestion than that which was openly apparent. Was he so dull, or was he... I had not time to finish my conjectures even in my own mind, for at this moment a quick cry rose behind us, and Lucetta's light figure appeared running toward us with every indication of excitement. Ah, murmured Mr. Trome, with an appearance of great respect. Your sister, Mr. Knollys. I had better be moving on. Good morning, Miss Butterworth. I am sorry that circumstances make it impossible for me to offer you those civilities which you might reasonably expect from so near a neighbour. Miss Lucetta and I are at sword's points over a matter upon which I still insist she is to blame. See how shocked she is to see me even standing at her gate. Shocked? I would have said terrified. Nothing but fear, 
her old fear aggravated to a point that made all attempt at concealment impossible could account for her white drawn features and trembling form she looked as if her whole thought was have i come in time what what has procured us the honour of this visit she asked moving up beside william as if she would add her slight frame to his bulky one to keep this intruder out nothing that need alarm you said the other with a suggestive note in his kind and mellow voice i was rather unexpectedly entrusted this morning with a letter for your agreeable guest here and i have merely come to deliver it her look of astonishment passing from him to me i thrust my hand into my pocket and drew out the letter which i had just received from home said i without properly considering that this was in some measure an untruth oh she murmured as if but half convinced william could have gone for it she added still eyeing mr trome with a pitiful anxiety i was only too happy said the other with a low and reassuring bow then as if he saw that her distress would only be relieved by his departure he raised his hat and stepped back into the open highway i will not intrude again miss knollys were his parting words if you want anything of obadiah trome you know where to find him his doors will always be open to you lucetta with a start laid her hand on her brother's arm as if to restrain the words she saw slowly labouring to his lips and leaning breathlessly forward watched the fine figure of this perfect country gentleman till it had withdrawn quite out of sight then she turned and with a quick abandonment of all self-control cried out with a pitiful gesture toward her brother i thought all was over i feared he meant to come into the house and fell stark and seemingly lifeless at our feet end of chapter nine chapter ten of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain secret instructions for a moment william and myself stood looking at each other over this frail and prostrate figure then he stooped and with an unexpected show of kindness raised her up and began carrying her toward the house lucetta is a fool he cried suddenly stopping and giving me a quick glance over his shoulder because folks are terrified of this road and come to see us but seldom she has got to feel a most unreasonable dread of visitors she was even set against your coming till we showed her what folly it was for her to think we could always live here like hermits then she doesn't like mr trome thinks he is altogether too friendly to me as if that was any of her business am i an idiot have i no sense cannot i be trusted to take care of my own affairs and keep my own secrets she's a weak silly chit to go and flop over like this when damn it we have enough to look after without nursing her up and i mean he said tripping himself up with an air of polite consideration so out of keeping with his usual churlishness as to be more than noticeable that it cannot add much to the pleasure of your visit to have such things happen as this oh don't worry about me i curtly responded get the poor girl in i'll look after her but as if she heard these words and was startled by them lucetta roused in her brother's arms and struggled passionately to her feet oh what has happened to me she cried have i said anything william have i said anything she asked wildly clinging to her brother in terror he gave her a look and pushed her off what are you talking about he cried one would think you had something to conceal she steadied herself up in an instant i am the weakest of the family said she walking straight up to me and taking me affectionately by the arm all my life i have been delicate and these turns are nothing new to me sometimes i think i will die in one of them but i am quite restored now she hastily added as i could not help showing my concern see i can walk quite alone 
and she ran rather than walked up the few short steps of the porch at which we had now arrived don't tell loreen she begged as i followed her into the house she worries so about me and it will do no good william had stalked off toward the stables we were therefore alone i turned and laid a finger on her arm my dear said i i never make foolish promises but i can be trusted never to heedlessly slight any one's wishes if i see no good reason why i should tell your sister of this fainting fit i shall certainly hold my peace she seemed moved by my manner if not by my words oh she cried seizing my hand and pressing it if i dared to tell you of my troubles but it is impossible quite impossible and before i could urge a plea for her confidence she was gone leaving me in the company of hannah who at this moment was busying herself with something at the other end of the hall i had no wish to interfere with hannah just then i had my letter to read and did not wish to be disturbed so i slipped into the sitting-room and carefully closed the door then i opened my letter it was as i supposed from mr gryce and ran thus dear miss butterworth i am astonished at your determination but since your desire to visit your friends is such as to lead you to brave the dangers of lost man's lane allow me to suggest certain precautions first do not trust anybody second do not proceed anywhere alone or on foot third if danger comes to you and you find yourself in a condition of real peril blow once shrilly on the whistle i enclose with this if however the danger is slight or you wish merely to call the attention of those who will be set to watch over you let the blast be short sharp and repeated twice to summon assistance three times to call attention i advise you to fasten this whistle about your neck in a way to make it easily obtainable i have advised you to trust nobody i should have accepted mr trome but i do not think you will be given an opportunity to speak to him remember that all depends upon your not awakening suspicion if however you wish advice or desire to make any communication to me or the man secretly holding charge over this affair in x seek the first opportunity of riding into town and go at once to the hotel where you will ask for room three it has been retained in your service and once shown into it you may expect a visitor who will be the man you seek as you will see every confidence is put in your judgment there was no signature to this it needed none and in the packet which came with it was the whistle i was glad to see it and glad to hear that i was not left entirely without protection in my somewhat hazardous enterprise the events of the morning had been so unexpected that till this moment i had forgotten my early determination to go to my room before any change there could be made recalling it now i started for the staircase and did not stop though i heard hannah calling me back the consequence was that i ran full tilt against miss knollys coming down the hall with a tray in her hand ah i cried someone sick in the house the attack was too sudden i saw her recoil and for one instant hesitate before replying then her natural self-possession came to her aid and she placidly remarked we were all up to a late hour last night as you know it was necessary for us to have some food i accepted the explanation and made no further remark but as in passing her i had detected on this tray of food supposed to have been sent up the night before the half-eaten portion of a certain dish we had had for breakfast I reserved to myself the privilege of doubting her exact truthfulness. To me, the sight of this partially consumed breakfast was proof positive of there being in the house 
some person of whose presence i was supposed to be ignorant not a pleasant thought under the circumstances but quite an important fact to have established i felt that in this one discovery i had clutched the thread that would yet lead me out of the labyrinth of this mystery miss knollys who was on her way downstairs called hannah to take the tray and coming back beckoned me toward a door opening into one of the front rooms this is to be your room she announced but i do not know that i can move you to-day she was so calm so perfectly mistress of herself that i could not but admire her lucetta would have flushed and fidgeted but loreen stood as erect and placid as if no trouble weighed upon her heart and the words were as unimportant in their character as they seemed do not distress yourself said i i told lucetta last night that i was perfectly comfortable and had no wish to change my quarters i am sorry you should have thought it necessary to disturb yourself on my account last night don't do it again i pray a woman like myself had rather put herself to some slight inconvenience than move i am much obliged to you said she and came at once from the door i don't know but after all i like lucetta's fidgety ways better than loreen's unmovable self-possession shall i order the coach for you she suddenly asked as i turned toward the corridor leading to my room the coach i repeated i thought that perhaps you might like to ride into town mr simsbury is at leisure this morning i regret that neither lucetta nor myself will be able to accompany you i thought what this same mr simsbury had said about lucetta's plan and hesitated it was evidently their wish to have me spend my morning elsewhere than with them should i humour them or find excuses for remaining home either course had its difficulties if i went what might not take place in my absence if i remained what suspicions might i not rouse i decided to compromise matters and start for town even if i did not go there i am hesitating said i because of the two or three rather threatening looking clouds toward the east but if you are sure mr simsbury can be spared i think i will risk it i really would like to get a key for my door and then riding in the country is so pleasant miss knollys with a bow passed immediately downstairs i went in a state of some doubt toward my own room am i surveying these occurrences through highly magnifying glasses thought i it was very possible yet not so possible but that i cast very curious glances at the various closed doors i had to pass before reaching my own such a little thing would make me feel like trying them such a little thing that is added to the other things which had struck me as unexplainable i found my bed made and everything in apple pie order i had therefore nothing to do but to prepare for going out this i did quickly and was downstairs sooner perhaps than i was expected at all events lucetta and william parted very suddenly when they saw me she in tears and he with a dogged shrug and some such word as this you're a fool to take on so since it's got to be the sooner the better i say don't you see that every minute makes less our chances of concealment it made me feel like changing my mind and staying home but the habit of a lifetime is not easily broken into i kept to my first decision end of chapter ten chapter eleven of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain men women and ghosts mr simsbury gave me quite an amiable bow as i entered the buggy this made it easy for me to say you are on hand early this morning do you sleep in the knollis house the stare he gave me had the least bit of suspicion in it i live over yonder he said pointing with his whip across the intervening woods to the main road 
I come through the marshes to my breakfast. My old woman says they owes me three meals, and three meals I must have. It was the longest sentence with which he had honoured me. Finding him in a talkative mood, I prepared to make myself agreeable, a proceeding which he seemed to appreciate, for he began to sniff and pay great attention to his horse, which he was elaborately turning about. "'Why do you go that way?' I protested. "'Isn't it the longest way to the village?' "'It's the way I'm most accustomed to,' said he. "'But we can go the other way if you like. "'Perhaps we will get a glimpse of Deacon Spear. "'He's a widower, you know.' "'The leer with which he said this was intolerable. "'I bridled up. "'But no, I will not admit that I so much as manifested by my manner "'that I understood him. "'I merely expressed my wish to go the old way.' He whipped up the horse at once, almost laughing outright. I began to think this man capable of most any wicked deed. He was forced, however, to pull up suddenly. Directly in our path was the stooping figure of a woman. She did not move as we advanced, and so we had no alternative but to stop. Not till the horse's head touched her shoulder did she move. Then she rose up and looked at us somewhat indignantly. "'Didn't you hear us?' I asked, willing to open conversation with the old crone, whom I had no difficulty in recognising as Mother Jane. "'She's deaf, deaf as a post,' muttered Mr. Simsbury. "'No use shouting at her.' His tone was brusque, yet I noticed he waited with great patience for her to hobble out of the way. Meanwhile, I was watching the old creature with much interest. She had not a common face or a common manner. She was grey, she was toothless, she was haggard, and she was bent. But she was not ordinary, or just one of the crowd of old women to be seen on country doorsteps. There was force in her aged movements, and a strong individuality in the glances she shot at us as she backed slowly out of the roadway. "'Do they say she is imbecile?' I asked. "'She looks far from foolish to me.' "'Hearken a bit,' said he. "'Don't you see she is muttering? "'She talks to herself all the time. "'And in fact her lips were moving. "'I cannot hear her,' I said. "'Make her come nearer. "'Somehow the old creature interests me.' "'He at once beckoned to the crone.' but he might as well have beckoned to the tree against which she had pushed herself. She neither answered him, nor gave any indication that she understood the gesture he had made. Yet her eyes never moved from our faces. Well, well, said I. She seems dull as well as deaf. You had better drive on. But before he could give the necessary jerk of the reins, I caught sight of some penny royal growing about the front of the cottage a few steps beyond and pointing to it with some eagerness, I cried, "'If there isn't some of the very herb I want to take home with me, do you think she would give me a handful of it if I paid her?' With an obliging grunt he again pulled up. "'If you can make her understand,' said he. I thought it worth the effort. Though Mr. Grice had been at pains to tell me there was no harm in this woman, and that I need not even consider her in any inquiries I might be called upon to make, I remembered that Mr. Grice had sometimes made mistakes in just such matters as these, and that Amelia Butterworth had then felt herself called upon to set him right. If that could happen once, why not twice? At all events, I was not going to lose the least chance of making the acquaintance of the people living in this lane. Had he not himself said, that only in this way could we hope to come upon the clue that had eluded all open efforts to find it. Knowing that the sight of money is the strongest appeal that can be made to one living in such abject poverty as this woman, making the blind to see and the deaf to hear, I drew out my purse and held up before her a piece of silver. She bounded as if she had been shot, and when I held it toward her came greedily forward and stood close beside the wheels looking up. "'For you,' I indicated, after making a motion toward the plant which had attracted my attention. She glanced from me to the herb, and nodded with quick appreciation. As in a flash, 
she seemed to take in the fact that i was a stranger a city lady with memories of the country and this humble plant and hurrying to it with the same swiftness she had displayed in advancing to the carriage she tore off several of the sprays and brought them back to me holding out her hand for the money i had never seen greater eagerness and i think even mr simsbury was astonished at this proof of her poverty or her greed i was inclined to think it the latter for her portly figure was far from looking either ill-fed or poorly cared for her dress was of decent calico and her pipe had evidently been lately filled for i could smell the odour of tobacco about her indeed as i afterward heard the good people of X had never allowed her to suffer. Yet her fingers closed upon that coin as if in it she grasped the salvation of her life, and into her eyes leaped a light that made her look almost young, though she must have been fully eighty. "'What do you suppose she will do with that?' I asked Mr. Simsbury, as she turned away in an evident fear I might repent of my bargain. "'Hark!' was his brief response she is talking now i did hearken and heard these words fall from her quickly moving lips seventy twenty-eight and now ten jargon for i had given her twenty-five cents an amount quite different from any she had mentioned seventy she was repeating the figures again this time in a tone of almost frenzied elation seventy Twenty-eight, and now ten. Won't Lizzie be surprised? Seventy, twenty. I heard no more. She had bounded into her cottage and shut the door. Well, what do you think of her now? chuckled Mr. Simsbury, touching up his horse. She's always like that, saying over numbers and muttering about Lizzie. Lizzie was her daughter. Forty years ago she ran off with a man from Boston and for thirty-eight years she's been lying in a Massachusetts grave. But her mother still thinks she is alive and is coming back. Nothing will ever make her think different. But she's harmless, perfectly harmless. You needn't be afeard of her. This because I cast a look behind me of more than ordinary curiosity, I suppose. Why were they all so sure she was harmless? I had thought her expression a little alarming at times especially when she took the money from my hand if i had refused it or even held it back a little i think she would have fallen upon me tooth and nail i wished i could take a peep into her cottage mr gryce had described it as four walls and nothing more and indeed it was small and of the humblest proportions but the fluttering of some half dozen pigeons about its eaves proved it to be a home and as such of interest to me who am often able to read character from a person's habitual surroundings there was no yard attached to this simple building only a small open place in front in which a few of the commonest vegetables grew such as turnips carrots and onions elsewhere towered the forest the great pine forest through which this portion of the road ran Mr. Simsbury had been so talkative up to now that I was in hope he would enter into some details about the persons and things we encountered, which might assist me in the acquaintanceship I was anxious to make. But his loquaciousness ended with this small adventure I have just described. Not till we were well quit of the pines and had entered into the main thoroughfare did he deign to respond to any of my suggestions and then it was in a manner totally unsatisfactory and quite uncommunicative. The only time he deigned to offer a remark was when we emerged from the forest and came upon the little crippled child looking from its window. Then he cried, Why, how's this? That's Sue you see there, and her time isn't till afternoon. Rob allers sits there of a morning. I wonder if the little chap's sick. Suppose I ask. As this was just what I would have suggested if he had given me time, I nodded complacently, and we drove up and stopped. The piping voice of the child at once spoke up. How do you do, Mr. Simsbury? Ma's in the kitchen. Rob isn't feeling good today. I thought her tone had a touch of mysteriousness in it. 
I greeted the pale little thing and asked if Rob was often sick. Never, she answered, except, like me, he can't walk. But I'm not to talk about it, Ma says. I'd like to, but... Ma's face appearing at this moment over her shoulder put an end to her innocent garrulity. How do you do, Mr. Simsbury? came a second time from the window, but this time in very different tones. What's the child been saying? She's so sot up at being allowed to take her brother's place in the window that she don't know how to keep her tongue still. Rob's a little languid, that's all. You'll see him in his old place tomorrow. And she drew back, as if in polite intimation that we might drive on. Mr. Simsbury responded to the suggestion, and in another moment we were trotting down the road. Had we stayed a minute longer, I think the child would have said something more or less interesting to hear. The horse, which had brought us thus far at a pretty sharp trot, now began to lag, which so attracted Mr. Simsbury's attention that he forgot to answer even by a grunt more than half of my questions. He spent most of his time looking at the nag's hind feet, and finally, just as we came in sight of the stores, he found his tongue sufficiently to announce that the horse was casting a shoe, and that he would be obliged to go to the blacksmith's with her. <laughs> "'And how long will that take?' I asked. "'He hesitated so long, rubbing his nose with his finger, "'that I grew suspicious and cast a glance at the horse's foot myself. "'The shoe was loose. I began to hear it clang. "'Well, it may be a matter of a couple of hours,' he finally drawled. "'We have no blacksmith in town, and the ride up there is two miles. "'Sorry it happened, ma'am, but there's all sorts of shops here, you see.' and I've always heard that a woman can easily spend two hours haggling away in shops. I glanced at the two ill-furnished windows he pointed out, thought of Arnold and Constables, Tiffany's, and the other New York establishments I had been in the habit of visiting, and suppressed my disdain. Either the man was a fool, or he was acting a part in the interests of Lucetta and her family. I rather inclined to the latter supposition. If the plan was to keep me out most of the morning, why could that shoe not have been loosened before the mare left the stable? I made all necessary purchases while in New York, said I, but if you must get the horse shod, why, take her off and do it. I suppose there is a hotel parlour near here where I can sit. Oh, yes, and he made haste to point out to me where the hotel stood. And it's a very nice place, ma'am. Mrs. Carter, the landlady, is the nicest sort of person. Only you won't try to go home, ma'am, on foot. You'll wait till I come back for you. It isn't likely I'll go streaking through Lost Man's Lane alone, I exclaimed indignantly. I'd rather sit in Mrs. Carter's parlour till night. And I would advise you to, he said. No use making gossip for the village folks. They have enough to talk about as it is. Not exactly seeing the force of this reasoning, but quite willing to be left to my own devices for a little while, I pointed to a locksmith's shop I saw nearby, and bade him put me down there. With a sniff I declined to interpret into a token of disapproval, he drove me up to the shop, and awkwardly assisted me to alight. Trunk key missing? he ventured to inquire, before getting back into his seat. I did not think it necessary to reply, but walked immediately into the shop. He looked dissatisfied at this, but whatever his feelings were, he refrained from any expression of them, and presently mounted to his place and drove off. I was left confronting the decent man who represented the lock-fitting interests in X. I found some difficulty in broaching my errand. Finally, I said, Miss Knollys, who lives up the road, wishes a key fitted to one of her doors. Will you come, or send a man to her house today? She is too occupied to see about it herself. The man must have been struck by my appearance, for he stared at me quite curiously for a minute. Then he gave a hem and a haw, and said, Certainly, what kind of a door is it? When I had answered, he gave me another curious glance, and seemed uneasy to step back to where his assistant was working with a file. 
"'You will be sure to come in time to have the lock fitted before night,' I said, in that peremptory manner of mine, which means simply, "'I keep my promises and expect you to keep yours.' His certainly struck me as a little weaker this time, possibly because his curiosity was excited. "'Are you the lady from New York who is staying with them?' he asked, stepping back, seemingly quite unawed by my positive demeanour. "'Yes,' said I, thawing a trifle. "'I am Miss Butterworth.' He looked at me almost as if I were a curiosity. "'And did you sleep there last night?' he urged. I thought it best to thaw still more. "'Of course,' I said. "'Where do you think I would sleep? "'The young ladies are friends of mine.' He rapped abstractedly on the counter with a small key he was holding. "'Excuse me,' said he, with some remembrance of my position toward him as a stranger, "'but weren't you afraid?' "'Afraid?' I echoed. "'Afraid in Miss Knollys's house?' "'Why, then, do you want a key to your door?' he asked, with a slight appearance of excitement. "'We don't lock doors here in the village. At least, we didn't.' "'I did not say it was my door,' I began, but feeling that this was a prevarication not only unworthy of me, but one that he was entirely too sharp to accept, I added stiffly, "'It is for my door.' I am not accustomed even at home to sleep with my room unlocked. Oh, he murmured, totally unconvinced. I thought you might have got a scare. Folks somehow are afraid of that old place. It's so big and ghost-like. I don't think you would find anyone in this village who would sleep there all night. A pleasing preparation for my rest tonight, I grimly laughed. Dangers on the road and ghosts in the house. Happily, I don't believe in the latter. The gesture he made showed incredulity. He had ceased rapping with the key, or even to show any wish to join his assistant. All his thoughts for the moment seemed to be concentrated on me. You don't know little Rob, he inquired, the crippled lad who lives at the head of the lane. No, I said, I haven't been in town a day yet, but I mean to know Rob and his sister too. Two cripples in one family rouse my interest. He did not say why he had spoken of the child, but began tapping with his key again. And you are sure you saw nothing, he whispered. Lots of things can happen in a lonely road like that. Not if everybody is as afraid to enter it as you say your villagers are, I retorted. But he didn't yield a jot. Some folks don't mind present dangers, said he. Spirits. But he received no encouragement in his return to this topic. You don't believe in spirits, said he. Well, they are doubtful sort of folks. But when honest and respectable people such as live in this town, when children even, see what answers to nothing but phantoms, then I remember what a wiser man than any of us once said. But perhaps you don't read Shakespeare, madam. Nonplussed for the moment, but interested in the man's talk more than was consistent with my need of haste, I said with some spirit, for it struck me as very ridiculous that this country mechanic should question my knowledge of the greatest dramatist of all time. Shakespeare and the Bible form the staple of my reading. At which he gave me a little nod of apology, and hastened to say, Then you know what I mean. Hamlet's remark to Horatio, madam, there are more things, etc. Your memory will readily supply you with the words. I signified my satisfaction and perfect comprehension of his meaning, and, feeling that something important lay behind his words, I endeavoured to make him speak more explicitly. The Mrs. Knollys show no terror of their home, I observed. They cannot believe in spirits either. Miss Knollys is a woman of a great deal of character, said he. But look at Lucetta. There is a face for you, for a girl not yet out of her twenties, and such a round-cheeked lass as she was once. Now, what has made the change? The sights and sounds of that old house, I say. 
Nothing else would give her that scared look. Nothing merely mortal, I mean. This was going a step too far. I could not discuss Lucetta with this stranger, anxious as I was to hear what he had to say about her. I don't know, I remonstrated, taking up my black satin bag, without which I never stir. One would think the terrors of the lane she lives in might account for some appearance of fear on her part. So it might, he assented, but with no great heartiness. But Lucetta has never spoken of those dangers. The people in the lane do not seem to fear them. Even Deacon Spear says that, set aside the wickedness of the thing, he rather enjoys the quiet which the ill repute of the lane gives him. I don't understand this indifference myself. I have no relish for horrible mysteries or for ghosts either. You won't forget the key, I suggested shortly, preparing to walk out, in my dread lest he should again introduce the subject of Lucetta. No, said he, I won't forget it. His tone should have warned me that I need not expect to have a locked door that night. End of chapter 11「The Phantom Coach » Ghosts! What could the fellow have meant? If I had pressed him, he would have told me, but it did not seem quite a lady's business to pick up information in this way, especially when it involved a young lady like Lucetta. Yet did I think I would ever come to the end of this matter without involving Lucetta? No. Why then did I allow my instincts to triumph over my judgment? Let those answer who understand the workings of the human heart. I am simply stating facts. Ghosts. Somehow the word startled me, as if in some way it gave a rather unwelcome confirmation to my doubts. Apparitions seen in the Knollis mansion, or in any of the houses bordering on this lane. That was a serious charge. How serious seemed to be but half comprehended by this man. But I comprehended it to the full, and wondered if it was on account of such gossip as this that Mr. Grice had persuaded me to enter Miss Knollis's house as a guest. I was crossing the street to the hotel as I indulged in these conjectures, and intent as my mind was upon them, I could not but note the curiosity and interest which my presence excited in the simple country folk invariably to be found lounging about a country tavern. Indeed, the whole neighbourhood seemed agog, and though I would have thought it derogatory to my dignity to notice the fact, I could not but see how many faces were peering at me from store doors and the half-closed blinds of adjoining cottages. No young girl in the pride of her beauty could have awakened more interest, and this I attributed, as was no doubt right, not to my appearance, which would not perhaps be apt to strike these simple villagers as remarkable, or to my dress, which is rather rich than fashionable but to the fact that I was a stranger in town, and, what was more extraordinary, a guest of the Mrs. Knollises. My intention in approaching the hotel was not to spend a couple of dreary hours in the parlour with Mrs. Carter, as Mr. Simsbury had suggested, but to obtain, if possible, a conveyance to carry me immediately back to the Knollis mansion. But this, which would have been a simple matter in most towns, seemed well-nigh an impossibility in X. The landlord was away, and Mrs. Carter, who was very frank with me, told me it would be perfectly useless to ask one of the men to drive me through the lane. It's an unwholesome spot, said she, and only Mr. Carter and the police have the courage to brave it. I suggested that I was willing to pay well, but it seemed to make very little difference to her. Money won't hire them, said she, and I had the satisfaction of knowing that Lucetta had triumphed in her plan, and that, after all, I must sit out the morning in the precincts of the hotel parlour with Mrs. Carter. 
it was my first signal defeat but i was determined to make the best of it and if possible glean such knowledge from the talk of this woman as would make me feel that i had lost nothing by my disappointment she was only too ready to talk and the first topic was little rob i saw the moment i mentioned his name that i was introducing a subject which had already been well talked over by every eager gossip in the village her attitude of importance the air of mystery she assumed were preparations i had long been accustomed to in women of this kind and i was not at all surprised when she announced in a way that admitted of no dispute oh there's no wonder the child is sick we would be sick under the circumstances he has seen the phantom coach the phantom coach so that was what the locksmith meant a phantom coach i had heard of every kind of phantom but that somehow the idea was a thrilling one or would have been to a nature less practical than mine i don't know what you mean said i some superstition of the place i never heard of a ghostly appearance of that nature before no i expect not it belongs to x i never heard of it beyond these mountains indeed i have never known it to have been seen but upon one road i need not mention what road madam you can guess yes i could guess and the guessing made me set my lips a little grimly tell me more about this thing i urged half laughing it ought to be of some interest to me she nodded drew her chair a trifle nearer and impetuously began you see this is a very old town it has more than one ancient country house similar to the one you are now living in and it has its early traditions one is that an old-fashioned coach perfectly noiseless drawn by horses through which you can see the moonlight haunts the high road at intervals and flies through the gloomy forest road we have christened of late years lost man's lane it is a superstition possibly but you cannot find many families in town but believe in it as a fact for there is not an old man or woman in the place but has either seen it in the past or has had some relative who has seen it it passes only at night and it is thought to presage some disaster to those who see it my husband's uncle died the next morning after it flew by him on the highway fortunately years elapse between its going and coming it is ten years i think they say since it was last seen poor little rob it has frightened him almost out of his wits i should think so i cried with becoming credulity but how came he to see it i thought you said it only passed at night at midnight she repeated but rob you see is a nervous lad and night before last he was so restless he could not sleep so he begged to be put in the window to cool off this his mother did and he sat there for a good half hour alone looking out at the moonlight as his mother is an economical woman there was no candle lit in the room so he got his pleasure out of the shadows which the great trees made on the high road when suddenly you ought to hear the little fellow tell it he felt the hair rise on his forehead and all his body grow stiff with a terror that made his tongue feel like lead in his mouth a something he would have called a horse and a carriage in the daytime but which in this light and under the influence of the mortal terror he was in took on a distorted shape which made it unlike any team he was accustomed to was going by not as if being driven over the earth and stones of the road though there was a driver in front a driver with an odd three-cornered hat on his head and a cloak about his shoulders such as the little fellow remembered to have seen hanging in his grandmother's closet but as if it floated along without sound or stir in fact a spectre team which seemed to find its proper destination when it turned into lost man's lane and was lost among the shadows of that ill-reputed road pshaw was my spirited comment as she paused to take her breath 
and see how i was affected by this gruesome tale a dream of the poor little lad he had heard stories of this apparition and his imagination supplied the rest no excuse me madam he had been carefully kept from hearing all such tales you could see this by the way he told his story he hardly believed what he had himself seen it was not till some foolish neighbour blurted out why that was the phantom coach that he had any idea he was not relating a dream my second psh was no less marked than the first he did know about it notwithstanding i insisted only he had forgotten the fact sleep often supplies us with these lost memories very true and your supposition is very plausible miss butterworth and might be regarded as correct if he had been the only person to see this apparition but mrs jenkins saw it too and she is a woman to be believed this was becoming serious saw it before he did or afterwards i asked does she live on the highway or somewhere in lost man's lane she lives on the highway about a half mile from the station she was sitting up with her sick husband and saw it just as it was going down the hill she said it made no more noise than a cloud slipping by she expects to lose old rouse no one could behold such a thing as that and not have some misfortune follow i laid all this up in my mind my hour of waiting was not likely to prove wholly unprofitable you see the good woman went on with a relish for the marvellous that stood me in good stead there is an old tradition of that road connected with a coach years ago before any of us were born and the house where you are now staying was a gathering place for all the gay young bloods of the county a young man came up from new york to visit mr knollys i do not mean the father or even the grandfather of the folks you are visiting ma'am he was great-grandfather to lucetta and a very fine gentleman if you can trust the pictures that are left of him but my story has not to do with him he had a daughter at that time a widow of great and sparkling attractions and though she was older than the young man i have mentioned every one thought he would marry her she was so handsome and such an heiress but he failed to pay his court to her and though he was handsome himself and made a fool of more than one girl in the town every one thought he would return as he had come a free-hearted bachelor when suddenly one night the coach was missed from the stables and he from the company which led to the discovery that the young widow's daughter was gone too a chit who was barely fifteen and without a hundredth part of the beauty of her mother love only could account for this for in those days young ladies did not ride with gentlemen in the evening for pleasure and when it came to the old gentleman's ears and what was worse came to the mother's there was a commotion in the great house the echoes of which some say have never died out though the pipers were playing and the fiddles were squeaking in the great room where they used to dance the night away mrs knollys with her white brocade tucked up about her waist stood with her hand on the great front door waiting for the horse upon which she was determined to follow the flying lovers the father who was a man of eighty years stood by her side he was too old to ride himself but he made no effort to hold her back though the jewels were tumbling from her hair and the moon had vanished from the highway i will bring her back or die the passionate beauty exclaimed and not a lip said her nay for they saw what neither man nor woman had been able to see up to that moment that her very life and soul were wrapped up in the man who had stolen away her daughter shrilly piped the pipes squeak and hum went the fiddles but the sound that was sweetest to her was the pound of the horse's hoofs on the road in front that was music indeed and as soon as she heard it she bestowed one wild kiss on her father and bounded from the house an instant later and she was gone one flash of her white robe at the gate then all was dark on the highway 
and only the old father stood in the wide open door waiting as he vowed he would wait till his daughter returned she did not go alone a faithful groom was behind her and from him was learned the conclusion of that quest for an hour and a half they rode then they came upon a chapel in the mountains in which were burning unwanted lights at the sight the lady drew rein and almost fell from her horse into the arms of her lackey a marriage she murmured a marriage and pointed to an empty coach standing in the shadow of a wide spreading tree it was their family coach how well she knew it rousing herself she made for the chapel door i will stop these unhallowed rites she cried i am her mother and she is not of age but the lackey drew her back by her rich white dress look he cried pointing in at one of the windows and she looked the man she loved stood before the altar with her daughter he was smiling in that daughter's face with a look of passionate devotion it went like a dagger to her heart crushing her hands against her face she wailed out some fearful protest then she dashed toward the door with stop stop on her lips but the faithful lackey at her side drew her back once more listen was his word and she listened the minister whose form she had failed to note in her first hurried look was uttering his benediction she had come too late the young couple were married her servant said or so the tradition runs that when she realized this she grew calm as walking death making her way into the chapel she stood ready at the door to greet them as they issued forth and when they saw her there with her rich bedraggled robe and the gleam of jewels on a neck she had not even stopped to envelop in more than the veil from her hair the bridegroom seemed to realize what he had done and stopped the bride who in her confusion would have fled back to the altar where she had just been made a wife kneel he cried kneel amarinth only thus can we ask pardon of our mother but at that word a word which seemed to push her a million miles away from these two beings who but two hours before had been the delight of her life the unhappy woman gave a cry and fled from their presence go go were her parting words as you have chosen you must abide but let no tongue ever again call me mother they found her lying on the grass outside as she could no longer sustain herself on a horse they put her into the coach gave the reins to her devoted lackey and themselves rode off on horseback one man the fellow who had driven them to that place said that the clock struck twelve from the chapel tower as the coach turned away and began its rapid journey home this may and may not be so we only know that its apparition always enters lost man's lane a few minutes before one which is the very hour at which the real coach came back and stopped before mr knollys's gate and now for the worst miss butterworth when the old gentleman went down to greet the runaways he found the lackey on the box and his daughter sitting all alone in the coach but the soil on the brocaded folds of her white dress was no longer that of mud only she had stabbed herself to the heart with a bodkin she wore in her hair and it was a corpse which the faithful negro had been driving down the highway that night i am not a sentimental woman but this story as thus told gave me a thrill i do not know as i really regret experiencing what was this unhappy mother's name i asked lucetta was the unexpected and none too reassuring answer end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
gossip this name once mentioned called for more gossip but of a somewhat different nature the lucetta of to-day is not like her ancient namesake observed mrs carter she may have the heart to love but she is not capable of showing that love by any act of daring i don't know about that i replied astonished that i felt willing to enter into a discussion with this woman on the very subject i had just shrunk from talking over with the locksmith girls as frail and nervous as she is sometimes astonish one at a pinch i do not think lucetta lacks daring you don't know her why i have seen her jump at the sight of a spider and heaven knows that they are common enough among the decaying walls in which she lives a puny chit miss butterworth pretty enough but weak the very kind to draw lovers but not to hold them yet every one pities her her smile is so heart-broken with ghosts to trouble her and a lover to bemoan she has surely some excuse for that said i yes i don't deny it but why has she a lover to bemoan he seemed a proper man and much beyond the ordinary why let him go as she did even her sister admits that she loved him i am not acquainted with the circumstances i suggested well there isn't much of a story to it he is a young man from over the mountains well educated and with something of a fortune of his own he came here to visit the spears i believe and seeing lucetta leaning one day on the gate in front of her house he fell in love with her and began to pay her his attentions that was before the lane got its present bad name but not before one or two men had vanished from among us william that is her brother you know has always been anxious to have his sisters marry so he did not stand in the way and no more did miss knollys but after two or three weeks of doubtful courtship the young man went away and that was the end of it and a great pity too say i for once clear of that house lucetta would grow into another person sunshine and love are necessities to most women miss butterworth especially to such as are weakly and timid i thought the qualification excellent you are right i assented and i should like to see the result of them upon lucetta then with an attempt to still further sound this woman's mind and with it the united mind of the whole village i remarked the young do not usually throw aside such prospects without excellent reasons have you never thought that lucetta was governed by principle in discarding this very excellent young man principle what principle could she have had in letting a desirable husband go she may have thought the match an undesirable one for him for him well i never thought of that true she may they are known to be poor but poverty don't count in such old families as theirs i hardly think she would be influenced by any such consideration now if this had happened since the lane got its bad name and all this stir had been made about the disappearance of certain folks within its precincts i might have given some weight to your suggestion women are so queer but this happened long ago and at a time when the family was highly thought of leastwise the girls for william does not go for much you know too stupid and too brutal william would the utterance of that name heighten my suggestion i surveyed her closely but could detect no change in her somewhat puzzled countenance my allusions were not in reference to the disappearances said i i was thinking of something else lucetta is not well ah i know they say she has some kind of heart complaint but that was not true then why her cheeks were like roses in those days and her figure as plump and pretty as any you could see among our village beauties no miss butterworth it was through her weakness she lost him she probably palled upon his taste it was noticed that he held his head very high in going out of town has he married since i asked not to my knowledge ma'am then he loved her i declared she looked at me quite curiously 
doubtless that word sounds a little queer on my lips but that shall not deter me from using it when the circumstances seem to require besides there was once a time but there i promised to fall into no digressions you should have been married yourself miss butterworth said she i was amazed first at her daring and secondly that i was so little angry at this sudden turning of the tables upon myself but then the woman meant no offence rather intended a compliment i am very well contented as i am i returned i am neither sickly nor timid she smiled looked as if she thought it only common politeness to agree with me and tried to say so but finding the situation too much for her coughed and discreetly held her peace i came to her rescue with a new question have the women of the knollys family ever been successful in love the mother of these girls say she who was miss althea burroughs was her life with her husband happy i have always been curious to know she and i were schoolmates you were you knew althea knollys when she was a girl wasn't she charming ma'am did you ever see a livelier girl or one with more knack at winning affection why she couldn't sit down with you a half hour before you felt like sharing everything you had with her it made no difference whether you were man or woman it was all the same she had but to turn those mischievous pleading eyes upon you for you to become a fool at once yet her end was sad ma'am too sad when you remember that she died at the very height of her beauty alone and in a foreign land but i have not answered your question were she and the judge happy together i have never heard to the contrary ma'am i am sure he mourned her faithfully enough some think that her loss killed him he did not survive her more than three years the children do not favour her much said i but i see an expression now and then in lucetta which reminds me of her mother they are all knollys said she even william has traits which with a few more brains back of them would remind you of his grandfather who was the plainest of his race i was glad that the talk had reverted to william he seems to lack heart as well as brains i said i marvel that his sisters put up with him as well as they do they cannot help it he is not a fellow to be fooled with besides he holds third share in the house if they could sell it but deary me who would buy an old tumble-down place like that on a road you cannot get folks who have any consideration for their lives to enter for love or money but excuse me ma'am i forgot that you are living just now on that very road i'm sure i beg a thousand pardons i am living there as a guest i returned i have nothing to do with its reputation except to brave it a courageous thing to do ma'am and one that may do the road some good if you can spend a month with the knollys girls and come out of their house at the end as hale and hearty as you entered it it will be the best proof possible that there is less to be feared there than some people think i shall be glad if you can do it ma'am for i like the girls and would be glad to have the reputation of the place restored pshaw was my final comment the credulity of the town has had as much to do with its loss as they themselves that educated people such as i see here should believe in ghosts i say final for at this moment the good lady springing up put an end to our conversation she had just seen a buggy pass the window it's mr trome she exclaimed ma'am if you wish to return home before mr simsbury comes back you may be able to do so with this gentleman he's a most obliging man and lives less than a quarter of a mile from the mrs knollys i did not say i had already met the gentleman why i do not know i only drew myself up and waited with some small inner perturbation for the result of the inquiry i saw she had gone to make end of chapter thirteen
Chapter fourteen of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I forget my age, or rather, remember it. Mr. Trome did not disappoint my expectations. In another moment I perceived him standing in the open doorway with the most genial smile on his lips. Miss Butterworth, said he, I feel too honoured. If you will deign to accept a seat in my buggy, I shall only be too happy to drive you home. I have always liked the manners of country gentlemen. There is just a touch of formality in their bearing, which has been quite eliminated from that of their city brothers. I therefore became gracious at once, and accepted the seat he offered me without any hesitation. The heads that showed themselves at the neighbouring windows warned us to hasten on our route. Mr. Trome, with a snap of his whip, touched up his horse, and we rode in dignified calm away from the hotel steps into the wide village street known as the main road. The fact that Mr. Grice had told me that this was the one man I could trust, joined to my own excellent knowledge of human nature, and the persons in whom explicit confidence can be put, made the moment one of great satisfaction to me. I was about to make my appearance at the Knollis mansion two hours before I was expected, and thus outwit Lucetta by means of the one man whose assistance I could conscientiously accept. We were not slow in beginning conversation. The fine air, the prosperous condition of the town, offered themes upon which we found it quite easy to dilate, and so naturally and easily did our acquaintanceship progress that we had turned the corner into Lost Man's Lane before I quite realised it. The entrance from the village offered a sharp contrast to the one I had already traversed. There it was but a narrow opening between sombre and unduly crowding trees. Here it was the gradual melting of a village street into a narrow and less frequented road, which, only after passing Deacon Spear's house, assumed that aspect of wildness which a quarter of a mile farther on deepened into something positively sombre and repellent. I speak of Deacon Spear because he was sitting on his front doorstep when we rode by. As he was a resident in the lane, I did not fail to take notice of him, though guardedly, and with such restraint as a knowledge of his widowed condition rendered both wise and proper. He was not an agreeable-looking person, at least to me. His hair was sleek, his beard well cared for, his whole person in good if not prosperous condition, but he had the self-satisfied expression I detest, and looked after us with an aspect of surprise I chose to consider a trifle impertinent. Perhaps he envied Mr. Trome. If so, he may have had good reason for it. It is not for me to judge. Up to now I had seen only a few scrub bushes at the side of the road, with here and there a solitary poplar to enliven the dead level on either side of us. But after we had ridden by the fence which sets the boundary to the good deacon's land, I noticed such a change in the appearance of the lane that I could not but exclaim over the natural as well as cultivated beauties which every passing moment was bringing before me. Mr. Trome could not conceal his pleasure. These are my lands, said he. I have bestowed unremitting attention upon them for years. It is my hobby, madam. There is not a tree you see that has not received my careful attention. Yonder orchard was set out by me, and the fruit it yields. Madam, I hope you will remain long enough with us to taste a certain rare and luscious peach that I brought from France a few years ago. It gives promise of reaching its full perfection this year, and I shall be gratified indeed if you can give it your approval. This was politeness indeed, especially as I knew what value men like him set upon each individual fruit they watch ripen under their care. Testifying my appreciation of his kindness, I endeavoured to introduce another and less harmless and perhaps less personally interesting topic of conversation. 
the chimneys of his house were beginning to show over the trees and i had heard nothing from this man on the subject which should have been the most interesting of all to me at this moment and he was the only person in town i was at liberty to really confide in and possibly the only man in town who could give me a reliable statement of the reasons why the family i was visiting was regarded in a doubtful light not only by the credulous villagers but by the new york police i began by an allusion to the phantom coach i hear said i that this lane has other claims to attention beyond those afforded by the mysteries connected with it i hear that it has at times a ghostly visitant in the shape of a spectral horse and carriage yes he replied with a seeming understanding that was very flattering do not spare the lane one of its honours it has its nightly horror as well as its daily fear i wish the one were as unreal as the other you act as if both were unreal to you said i the contrast between your appearance and that of some other members of the lane is quite marked you refer he seemed to hate to speak to the mrs knollys i presume i endeavoured to treat the subject lightly to your young enemy lucetta i smilingly replied he had been looking at me in a perfectly modest and respectful manner but he dropped his eyes at this and busied himself abstractedly and yet i thought with some intention in removing a fly from the horse's flank with the tip of his whip i will not acknowledge her as an enemy he quietly returned in strictly modulated tones i like the girl too well the fly had been by this time dislodged but he did not look up and william i suggested what do you think of william slowly he straightened himself slowly he dropped the whip back into its socket i thought he was going to answer when suddenly his whole attitude changed and he turned upon me a beaming face full of nothing but pleasure the road takes a turn here in another moment you will see my house and even while he spoke it burst upon us and i instantly forgot that i had just ventured on a somewhat hazardous question it was such a pretty place and it was so beautifully and exquisitely kept there was a charm about its rose encircled porch that is only to be found in very old places that have been appreciatively cared for a high fence painted white enclosed a lawn like velvet and the house itself shining with a fresh coat of yellow paint bore signs of comfort in its white curtained windows not usually to be found in the solitary dwelling of a bachelor i found my eyes roving over each detail with delight and almost blushed or rather had i been twenty years younger might have been thought to blush as i met his eyes and saw how much my pleasure gratified him you must excuse me if i express too much admiration for what i see before me i said with what i have every reason to believe was a highly successful effort to hide my confusion i have always had a great leaning towards well-ordered walks and trimly kept flower beds a leaning alas which i have found myself unable to gratify do not apologize he hastened to say you but redouble my own pleasure in thus honouring my poor efforts with your regard i have spared no pains madam i have spared no pains to render this place beautiful and most of what you see i am proud to say has been accomplished by my own hands indeed i cried in some surprise letting my eye rest with satisfaction on the top of a long well-sweep that was one of the picturesque features of the place it may have been folly he remarked with a gloating sweep of his eye over the velvet lawn and flowering shrubs a peculiar look that seemed to express something more than the mere delight of possession but i seemed to begrudge any hired assistance in the tending of plants every one of which seems to me like a personal friend i understand 
was my somewhat unbutterworthian reply i really did not quite know myself what a contrast to the dismal grounds at the other end of the lane this was more in my usual vein he seemed to feel the difference for his expression changed at my remark oh that den he exclaimed bitterly then seeing me look a little shocked he added with an admirable return to his old manner i call any place a den where flowers do not grow and jumping from the buggy he gathered an exquisite bunch of heliotrope which he pressed upon me i love sunshine beds of roses fountains and a sweep of lawn like this we see before us but do not let me bore you you have probably lingered long enough at the old bachelor's place and now would like to drive on i will be with you in a moment doubtful as it is whether i shall soon again be so fortunate as to be able to offer you any hospitality i would like to bring you a glass of wine or for i see your eyes roaming longingly toward my old-fashioned well would you like a draught of water fresh from the bucket i assured him i did not drink wine at which i thought his eyes brightened but that neither did i indulge in water when in a heat as at present at which he looked disappointed and came somewhat reluctantly back to the buggy he brightened up however the moment he was again at my side now for the woods he exclaimed with what was undoubtedly a forced laugh i thought the opportunity one i ought not to slight do you think said i that it is in those woods the disappearances occur of which miss knollys has told me he showed the same hesitancy as before to enter upon this subject i think the less you allow your mind to dwell on this matter the better said he that is if you are going to remain long in this lane i do not expend any more thought upon it than is barely necessary or i should not retain sufficient courage to remain among my roses and my fruits i wonder pardon me the indiscretion that you could bring yourself to enter so ill-reputed a neighbourhood you must be a very brave woman i thought it my duty i began althea knollys was my friend and i felt i owed a duty toward her children besides should i tell mr trome my real errand in this place mr gryce had intimated that he was in the confidence of the police and if so his assistance in case of necessity might be of inestimable value to me yet if no such necessity should arise would i want this man to know that amelia butterworth no i would not take him into my confidence not yet i would only try to get at his idea of where the blame lay that is if he had any besides he suggested in polite reminder after waiting a minute or two for me to continue did i say besides was my innocent rejoinder i think i meant that after seeing them my sense of the importance of that duty had increased william especially seems to be a young man of very doubtful amiability immediately the non-committal look returned to mr trome's face i have no fault to find with william said he he's not the most agreeable companion in the world perhaps but he has a pretty fancy for fruit a very pretty fancy one can hardly wonder at that in a neighbour of mr trome said i watching his look which was fixed somewhat gloomily upon the forest of trees now rapidly closing in around us perhaps not perhaps not madam the sight of a blossoming honeysuckle hanging from an arbour such as runs along my south walls is a great stimulant to one's taste madam i'll not deny that but william i repeated determined not to let the subject go have you never thought he was a little indifferent to his sisters a little madam and a trifle rough to everything but his dogs a trifle madam such reticence seemed unnecessary i was almost angry but restrained myself and pursued quietly the girls on the contrary 
seem devoted to him women have that weakness and act as if they would do what would they not do for him miss butterworth i have never seen a more amiable woman than yourself will you promise me one thing his manner was respect itself his smile genial and highly contagious i could not help responding to it in the way he expected do not talk to me about this family it is a painful subject to me lucetta you know the girl and i shall not be able to prejudice you against her has conceived the idea that i encourage william in an intimacy of which she does not approve she does not want him to talk to me william has a loose tongue in his head and sometimes drops unguarded words about their doings which if any but william spoke but there i am forgetting one of the most important rules of my own life which is to keep my mouth from babbling and my tongue from guile influence of a congenial companion madam it is irresistible sometimes especially to a man living so much alone as myself i considered his fault very pardonable but did not say so lest i should frighten his confidences away i thought there was something wrong between you i said lucetta acted almost afraid of you this morning i should think she would be glad of the friendship of so good a neighbour his face took on a very sombre look she is afraid of me he admitted afraid of what i have seen or may see of their poverty he added with an odd emphasis i scarcely think he expected to deceive me i did not push the subject an inch further i saw it had gone as far as discretion permitted at this time we had reached the heart of the forest and were rapidly approaching the knollis house as the tops of its great chimneys rose above the foliage i saw his aspect suddenly change i don't know why i should so hate to leave you here he remarked i myself thought the prospect of re-entering the knollis mansion somewhat uninviting after the pleasant ride i had had and the glimpse which had been given me of a really cheery home and pleasant surroundings this morning i looked upon you as a somewhat daring woman the progress of whose stay here would be watched by me with interest but after the companionship of the last half hour i am conscious of an anxiety in your regard which makes me doubly wish that miss knollys had not shut me out from her home are you sure you wish to enter this house again madam i was surprised really surprised at the feeling he showed if my well-disciplined heart had known how to flutter it would probably have fluttered then but happily the restraint of years did not fail me in this emergency taking advantage of the emotion which had betrayed him into an acknowledgment of his real feelings regarding the dangers lurking in this home despite the check he had endeavoured to put upon his lips i said with an attempt at naivety only to be excused by the exigencies of the occasion why i thought you considered this domicile perfectly harmless you like the girls and have no fault to find with william can it be that this great building has another occupant i do not allude to ghosts neither of us are likely to believe in the supernatural miss butterworth you have me at a disadvantage i do not know of any other occupant which the house can hold save the three young people you have mentioned if i seem to feel any doubt of them but i don't feel any doubt i only dread any place for you which is not watched over by someone interested in your defence the danger threatening the inhabitants of this lane is such a veiled one if we knew where it lurked we would no longer call it danger sometimes i think the ghosts you allude to are not as innocent as mere spectres usually are but don't let me frighten you don't how quick his voice changed ah william i have brought back your guest you see i couldn't let her sit out the noon hour in old carter's parlour that would be too much for even so amiable a person as miss butterworth to endure i had hardly realised we were so near the gate 
and certainly was surprised to find William anywhere within hearing. That his appearance at this moment was anything but welcome must be evident to every one. The sentence which it interrupted might have contained the most important advice, or at the least a warning I could ill afford to lose. But destiny was against me, and being one who accepts the inevitable with good grace, I prepared to alight with Mr. Trome's assistance. The bunch of heliotrope I held was a little in my way, or I should have managed the jump with confidence and dignified agility. As it was, I tripped slightly, which brought out a chuckle from William that at the moment seemed more wicked to me than any crime. Meanwhile, he had not let matters proceed thus far without putting more than one question. And where's Simsbury? And why did Miss Butterworth think she had got to sit in Carter's parlour? Mr. Simsbury, said I, as soon as I could recover from the mingled exertion and embarrassment of my descent to terra firma, felt it necessary to take the horse to the shoers. That is a half day's work, as you know, and I felt confident that he, and especially you, would be glad to have me accept any means for escaping so dreary a waiting. The grunt, he uttered, was eloquent of anything but satisfaction. I'll go tell the girls, he said. But he didn't go till he had seen Mr. Trome enter his buggy and drive slowly off. That all this did not add to my liking for William goes without saying. End of chapter 14「Chapter Fifteen of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Book Two The Flower Parlour. Lucetta fulfils my expectation of her. It was not till Mr. Trome had driven away that I noticed, in the shadow of the trees on the opposite side of the road, a horse tied up whose empty saddle bespoke a visitor within. At any other gate, and on any other road, this would not have struck me as worthy of notice, much less of comment. But here, and after all that I had heard during the morning, the circumstance was so unexpected I could not help showing my astonishment. A visitor? I asked. Someone to see Lucetta. William had no sooner said this than I saw he was in a state of high excitement. He had probably been in this condition when we drove up, but my attention being directed elsewhere, I had not noticed it. Now, however, it was perfectly plain to me, and it did not seem quite the excitement of displeasure, though hardly that of joy. She doesn't expect you yet, he pursued, as I turned sharply toward the house. And if you interrupt her, damn it, if I thought you would interrupt her. I thought it time to teach him a lesson in manners. Mr. Knollys, I interposed somewhat severely. I am a lady. Why should I interrupt your sister, or give her or you a moment of pain? I don't know, he muttered. You are so very quick, I was afraid you might think it necessary to join her in the parlour. She is perfectly able to take care of herself, Miss Butterworth and if she don't do it, the rest was lost in indistinct guttural sounds. I made no effort to answer this tirade. I took my usual course in quite my usual way to the front steps, and proceeded to mount them without so much as looking behind me to see whether or not this uncouth representative of the Knollys name had kept at my heels or not. Entering the door, which was open, I came without any effort on my part upon Lucetta and her visitor, who proved to be a young gentleman. They were standing together in the middle of the hall, and were so absorbed in what they were saying that they neither saw nor heard me. I was therefore enabled to catch the following sentences, which struck me as of some moment. The first was uttered by her, and in very pleading tones. A week! I only ask a week, 
then perhaps i can give you an answer which will satisfy you his reply in manner if not in matter proclaimed him the lover of whom i had so lately heard i cannot dear girl indeed i cannot my whole future depends upon my immediately making the move in which i have asked you to join me if i wait a week my opportunity will be gone lucetta you know me and you know how i love you then come a rude hand on my shoulder distracted my attention william stood lowering behind me and as i turned whispered in my ear you must come round the other way lucetta is so touchy the sight of you will drive every sensible idea out of her head his blundering whisper did what my presence and by no means light footsteps had failed to do with a start lucetta turned and meeting my eye drew back in visible confusion the young man followed her hastily is it good-bye lucetta he pleaded with a fine manly ignoring of our presence that roused my admiration she did not answer her look was enough william seeing it turned furious at once and bounding by me faced the young man with an oath you're a fool to take no from a silly chit like that he vociferated if i loved a girl as you say you love lucetta i'd have her if i had to carry her away by force she'd stop screaming before she was well out of the lane i know women while you listen to them they'll talk and talk but once let a man take matters into his own hands and a snap of his fingers finished the sentence i thought the fellow brutal but scarcely so stupid as i had heretofore considered him his words however might just as well have been uttered into empty air the young man he so violently addressed appeared hardly to have heard him and as for lucetta she was so nearly insensible from misery that she had sufficient to do to keep herself from falling at her lover's feet lucetta lucetta is it then good-bye you will not go with me i cannot william here knows that i cannot i must wait till but here her brother seized her so violently by the wrist that she stopped from sheer pain i fear however that was she turned pale as death under his clutch and when he tried to utter some hot passionate words into her ear shook her head but did not speak though her lover was gazing with a last final appeal into her eyes the delicate girl was bearing out my estimate of her seeing her thus unresponsive william flung her hand from him and turned upon me it's your fault he cried you would come in but at this lucetta recovering her poise in a moment cried out shrilly for shame william what has miss butterworth to do with this you are not helping me with your roughness god knows i find this hour hard enough without this show of anxiety on your part to be rid of me there's woman's gratitude for you was his snarling reply i offer to take all the responsibilities on my own shoulders and make it right with with her sister and all that and she calls it desire to get rid of her well have your own way he growled storming down the hall i'm done with it for one the young man whose attitude of reserve mixed with a strange and lingering tenderness for this girl whom he evidently loved without fully understanding her was every minute winning more and more of my admiration had meanwhile raised her trembling hand to his lips in what was as we all could see a last farewell in another moment he was walking by us giving me as he passed a low bow that for all its grace did not succeed in hiding from me the deep and heartfelt disappointment with which he quitted this house as his figure passed through the door hiding for one moment the sunshine i felt an oppression such as has not often visited my healthy nature and when it passed and disappeared something like the good spirit of the place seemed to go with it leaving in its place doubt gloom and a morbid apprehension of that unknown something which in lucetta's eyes 
had rendered his dismissal necessary. "'Where's Saracen? I declare I'm nothing but a fool without that dog,' shouted William. "'If he has to be tied up another day—' But shame was not entirely eliminated from his breast, for at Lucetta's reproachful, "'William!' He sheepishly dropped his head and strode out, muttering some words I was fain to accept as an apology. I had expected to encounter a wreck in Lucetta, as this episode in her life closed, she turned toward me. But I did not yet know this girl, whose frailty seemed to lie mostly in her physique. Though she was suffering far more than her defence of me to her brother would seem to denote, there was a spirit in her approach, and a steady look in her dark eye, which assured me that I could not calculate upon any loss in Lucetta's keenness, in case we came to an issue over the mystery that was eating into the happiness, as well as the honour of this household. "'I am glad to see you,' were her unexpected words. "'The gentleman who has just gone out was a lover of mine, at least he once professed to care for me very much, and I should have been glad to have married him. But there were reasons which I once thought most excellent why this seemed anything but expedient, and so I sent him away. Today he came without warning to ask me to go away with him, after the hastiest of ceremonies, to South America, where a splendid prospect has suddenly opened for him. You see, don't you, that I could not do that, that it would be the height of selfishness in me to leave Loreen, to leave William, who seems only too anxious to be left, I put in, as her voice trailed off in the first evidence of embarrassment she had shown since she faced me. William is a difficult man to understand, was her firm but quiet retort. From his talk you would judge him to be morose, if not positively unkind, but in action... She did not tell me how he was in action. Perhaps her truthfulness got the better of her, or perhaps she saw it would be hard work to prejudice me now in his favour. End of chapter 15《ハッチャプタ16》of《Lost Man's Lane》by Anna Catherine Green。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Loreen. Lucetta had said to her departing lover that in a week she might be able, were he willing or in a position to wait, to give him a more satisfactory answer. Why in a week? That her hesitation sprang from the mere dislike of leaving her sister so suddenly or that she had sacrificed her life's happiness to any childish idea of decorum, I did not think probable. The spirit she had shown, her immovable attitude under a temptation which had not only romance to recommend it, but everything else which could affect a young and sensitive woman, argued in my mind the existence of some uncompleted duty, of so exacting and imperative a nature that she could not even consider the greatest interests of her own life until this one thing was out of her way. William's rude question of the morning, what shall we do with the old girl till it is all over, recurred to me in support of this theory, making me feel that I needed no further confirmation to be quite certain that a crisis was approaching in this house which would tax my powers to the utmost and call perhaps for the use of the whistle which i had received from mr gryce and which following his instructions i had tied carefully about my neck yet how could i associate lucetta with crime or dream of the police in connection with the serene loreen whose every look was a rebuke to all that was false vile or even common easily my readers easily with that great hulking William in my remembrance, to shield him, to hide perhaps his deformity of soul from the world, even such gentle and gracious women as these have been known to enter into acts which to an unprejudiced eye and an unbiased conscience 
would seem little short of fiendish love for an unworthy relative or rather the sense of duty toward those of one's own blood has driven many a clear-minded woman to her ruin as may be seen any day in the police annals i am quite aware that i have not as yet put into definite words the suspicion upon which i was now prepared to work up to this time it had been too vague or rather of too monstrous a character for me not to consider other theories such as for instance the possible connection of old mother jane with the unaccountable disappearances which had taken place in this lane but after this scene the increased assurance i was hourly receiving that something extraordinary and out of keeping with the customary appearances of the household was secretly going on in some one of the various chambers of that long corridor i had been prevented from entering forced me to accept and act upon the belief that these young women held in charge a prisoner of some kind of whose presence in the house they dreaded the discovery now who could this prisoner be common sense supplied me with but one answer silly rufus the boy who within a few days had vanished from among the good people of this seemingly guileless community this theory once established in my mind i applied myself to a consideration of the means at my disposal for determining its validity the simplest surest but least satisfactory to one of my nature was to summon the police and have the house thoroughly searched but this involved in case i had been deceived by appearances as was possible even to a woman of my experience and discrimination a scandal and an opprobrium which i would be the last to inflict upon althea's children unless justice to the rest of the world demanded it it was in consideration of this very fact perhaps that i had been chosen for this duty instead of some regular police spy mr gryce as i very well knew has made it his rule of life never to risk the reputation of any man or woman without reasons so excellent as to carry their own exoneration with them and should i a woman with full as much heart as himself if not quite as much brain at least in the estimation of people in general by any premature exposure of my suspicions subject these young friends of mine to humiliations they are far too weak and too poor to rise above no rather would i trust a little longer to my own perspicacity and make sure by the use of my own eyes that the situation called for the interference i had as you may say at the end of the cord i wore about my neck lucetta had not asked me how i came to be back so much sooner than she had reason to expect me the unlooked-for arrival of her lover had probably put all idea of her former plans out of her head i therefore gave her the shortest of explanations when we met at the dinner-table nothing further seemed to be necessary for the girls were even more abstracted than before and william positively boorish till a warning glance from loreen recalled him to his better self which meant silence the afternoon was spent in very much the same way as the evening before neither sister remained an instant with me after the other entered my company and though the alternations were less frequent than at that time their peculiarities were more marked and less naturally accounted for it was while loreen was with me that i made the suggestion which had been hovering on my lips ever since the noon i consider this i observed in one of the pauses of our more than fitful conversation one of the most interesting houses it has ever been my good fortune to enter would you mind my roaming about a bit just to enjoy the old-time flavour of its great empty rooms i know they are mostly closed and possibly unfurnished but to a connoisseur like myself in colonial architecture this rather adds to than detracts from their interest impossible she was going to say but caught herself back in time 
and changed the imperative word to one more conciliatory if equally unyielding i am sorry miss butterworth to deny you this gratification but the condition of the rooms and the unhappy excitement into which we have been thrown by the unfortunate visit paid to lucetta by a gentleman to whom she is only too much attached make it quite impossible for me to consider any such undertaking to-day to-morrow i may find it easier but if not be assured you shall see every nook and corner of this house before you finally leave it thank you i will remember that to one of my tastes an ancient room in a time-honoured mansion like this affords a delight not to be understood by one who knows less of the last century's life the legends connected with your great drawing-room below we were sitting in my room i having refused to be cooped up in their dreary side parlour and she not having offered me any other spot more cheerful are sufficient in themselves to hold me entranced for an hour i heard one of them to-day which she spoke more quickly than usual and for her quite sharply that of lucetta's namesake i explained she who rode through the night after a daughter who had won her lover's heart away from her ah it is a well-known tale but i think mrs carter might have left its relation to us did she tell you anything else no other tradition of this place i assured her i am glad she was so considerate but why if you will pardon me did she happen to light upon that story we have not heard those incidents spoken of for years not since the phantom coach flew through this road the last time i ventured with a smile that should have disarmed her from suspecting any ulterior motive on my part in thus introducing a subject which could not be altogether pleasing to her the phantom coach have you heard of that i wish it had been lucetta who had said this and to whom my reply was due the opportunities would have been much greater for an injudicious display of feeling on her part and for a suitable conclusion on mine but it was laureen and she never forgot herself so i had to content myself with the persuasion that her voice was just a whit less clear than usual and her serenity enough impaired for her to look out of my one high and dismal window instead of into my face my dear i had not called her this before though the term had frequently risen to my lips in answer to lucetta you should have gone with me into the village to-day then you would not need to ask if i had heard of the phantom coach the probe had reached the quick at last she looked quite startled you amaze me she said what do you mean miss butterworth why should i not have needed to ask because you would have heard it whispered about in every lane and corner it is common talk in town to-day you must know why miss knollys she was not looking out of the window now she was looking at me i assure you she murmured i do not know at all nothing could be more incomprehensible to me explain yourself i entreat you the phantom coach is but a myth to me interesting only as involving certain long vanished ancestors of mine of course i assented no one of real sense could regard it in any other light but villagers will talk and they say you will soon know what if i do not tell you myself that it passed through the lane on tuesday night tuesday night her composure had been regained but not so entirely but that her voice slightly trembled that was before you came i hope it was not an omen i was in no mood for pleasantry they say that the passing of this apparition denotes misfortune to those who see it i am therefore obviously exempt but you did you see it i am just curious to know if it is visible to those who live in the lane it ought to have turned in here were you fortunate enough to have been awake at that moment and to have seen this spectral appearance she shuddered 
i was not mistaken in believing i saw this sign of emotion for i was watching her very closely and the movement was unmistakable i have never seen anything ghostly in my life said she i am not at all superstitious if i had been ill-natured or if i had thought it wise to press her too closely i might have inquired why she looked so pale and trembled so visibly but my natural kindness together with an instinct of caution restrained me and i only remarked there you are sensible miss knollys doubly so as a denizen of this house which mrs carter was obliging enough to suggest to me is considered by many as haunted the straightening of miss knollys's lips augured no good to mrs carter now i only wish it was i laughed dryly i should really like to meet a ghost say in your great drawing-room which i am forbidden to enter you are not forbidden she hastily returned you may explore it now if you will excuse me from accompanying you but you will meet no ghosts the hour is not propitious taken aback by her sudden amenity i hesitated for a moment would it be worth while for me to search a room she was willing to have me enter no and yet any knowledge which could be obtained in regard to this house might be of use to me or mr gryce i decided to embrace her offer after first testing her with one other question would you prefer to have me steal down these corridors at night and dare their dusky recesses at a time when spectres are supposed to walk the halls they once flitted through in happy consciousness hardly she made the greatest effort to sustain the jest but her concern and dread were manifest i think i had better give you the keys now than subject you to the draughts and chilling discomforts of this old place at midnight i rose with a semblance of eager anticipation i will take you at your word said i the keys my dear i am going to visit a haunted room for the first time in my life i do not think she was deceived by this feigned ebullition perhaps it was too much out of keeping with my ordinary manner but she gave no sign of surprise and rose in her turn with an air suggestive of relief excuse me if i precede you she begged i will meet you at the head of the corridor with the keys i was in hopes she would be long enough in obtaining them to allow me to stroll along the front hall to the opening into the corridor i was so anxious to enter but the spryness i showed seemed to have a corresponding effect upon her for she almost flew down the passageway before me and was back at my side before i could take a step in the coveted direction these will take you into any room on the first floor said she you will meet with dust and lucetta's abhorrence spiders but for these i shall make no apologies girls who cannot provide comforts for the few rooms they utilize cannot be expected to keep in order the large and disused apartments of a former generation i hate dirt and despise spiders was my dry retort but i am willing to brave both for the pleasure of satisfying my love for the antique at which she handed me the keys with a calm smile which was not without its element of sadness i will be here on your return she said leaning over the banisters to speak to me as i took my first steps down i shall want to hear whether you are repaid for your trouble i thanked her and proceeded on my way somewhat doubtful whether by so doing i was making the best possible use of my opportunities end of chapter 16「seventeen of Lost Man's Lane by Anna Catherine Green. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Flower Parlour. The lower hall did not correspond exactly with the one above. 
It was larger, and through its connection with the front door, presented the shape of a letter T, that is, to the superficial observer, who was not acquainted with the size of the house, and had not had the opportunity of remarking that at the extremities of the upper hall making this T were two imposing doors, usually found shut except at meal times, when the left-hand one was thrown open, disclosing a long and dismal corridor similar to the ones above. Halfway down this corridor was the dining-room, into which I had now been taken three times. The right-hand one, I had no doubt, led the way into the great drawing-room or dancing-hall, which I had started out to see. Proceeding first to the front of the house, where some glimmer of light penetrated from the open sitting-room door, I looked the keys over and read what was written on the several tags attached to them. They were seven in number and bore some such names as these. Blue Chamber, Library, Flower Parlour, Shell Cabinet, Dark Parlour, all of which was very suggestive and, to an antiquarian like myself, most alluring. But it was upon a key marked A I first fixed my attention. This, I had been told, would open the large door at the extremity of the upper hall, and when I made a trial with it, I found it to move easily, though somewhat gratingly, in the lock, releasing the great doors, which in another moment swung inward with a growling sound, which might have been startling to a nervous person filled with the legends of the place. But in me the only emotion awakened was one of disgust at the nauseous character of the air which instantly enveloped me. Had I wished for any further proof than was afforded by the warning given me by the condition of the hinges, that the foot of man had not lately invaded these precincts, I would have had it in the mouldy atmosphere and smell of dust that greeted me on the threshold. Neither human breath nor a ray of outdoor sunshine seemed to have disturbed its gloomy quiet for years, and when I moved, as I presently did, to open one of the windows I dimly discerned at my right, I felt such a movement of something foul and noisome amid the decaying rags of the carpet through which I was stumbling, that I had to call into use the stronger elements of my character, not to back out of a place so given over to rot and the creatures that infest it. What a spot, thought I, for Amelia Butterworth to find herself in, and wondered if I could ever wear again the three dollar a yard silk dress in which I was then enveloped. Of my shoes I took no account. They were ruined, of course. I reached the window in safety, but could not open it. Neither could I move the adjoining one. There were sixteen in all, or so I afterwards found, and not till I reached the last, you see, I am very persistent, did I succeed in loosening the bar that held its inner shutter in place. This done, I was able to lift the window and for the first time in years, perhaps, let in a ray of light into this desolated apartment. The result was disappointing. Mouldy walls, worm-eaten hangings, two very ancient and quaint fireplaces met my eyes, and nothing more. The room was absolutely empty. For a few minutes I allowed my eyes to roam over the great rectangular space in which so much that was curious and interesting had once taken place, and then, with a vague sense of defeat, turned my eyes outward, anxious to see what view could be obtained from the window I had opened. To my astonishment, I saw before me a high wall, with here and there a window in it, all tightly barred and closed, till, by a careful inspection about me, I realised that I was looking upon the other wing of the building, and that between these wings extended a court so narrow and long that it gave to the building the shape, as I have before said, of the letter U, a dreary prospect, reminding one of the view from a prison. But it had its point of interest, for in the court below me, 
the brick pavement of which was half obliterated by grass i caught sight of william in an attitude so different from any i had hitherto seen him assume that i found it difficult to account for it till i caught sight of the jaws of a dog protruding from under his arms and then i realized he was hugging saracen the dog was tied but the comfort which william seemed to take in just this physical contact with his rough skin was something worth seeing it made me quite thoughtful for a moment i detest dogs and it gives me a creepy sensation to see them fondled but sincerity of feeling appeals to me and no one could watch william knollys with his dogs without seeing that he really loved the brutes thus in one day i had witnessed the best and worst side of this man but wait had i seen the worst i was not so sure that i had he had not noticed my peering for which i was duly thankful and after another fruitless survey of the windows in the wall before me i drew back and prepared to leave the place this was by no means a pleasant undertaking i could now see what i had only felt before and to traverse the space before me amid beetles and spiders required a determination of no ordinary nature i was glad when i reached the great doors and more than glad when they closed behind me so much for room a thought i the next most promising apartment was in the same corridor as the dining room it was called the dark parlor entering it i found it dark indeed but not because of lack of light but because its hangings were all of a dismal red and its furniture of the blackest ebony as this mainly consisted of shelves and cabinets placed against three of its four walls the effect was gloomy indeed and fully accounted for the name which the room had received i lingered in it however longer than i had in the big drawing-room chiefly because the shelves contained books had anything better offered i might not have continued my explorations but not seeing exactly how i could pass away the time more profitably i chose out another key and began to search for the flower parlour i found it beyond the dining-room in the same hall as the dark parlour it was as i might have expected from the name the brightest and most cheerful spot i had yet found in the whole house the air in it was even good as if sunshine and breeze had not been altogether shut out of it yet i had no sooner taken one look at its flower-painted walls and pretty furniture than i felt an oppression difficult to account for something was wrong about this room i am not superstitious and have no faith in premonitions but once seized by a conviction i have never known myself to be mistaken as to its import something was wrong about this room what it was my business to discover letting in more light i took a closer survey of the objects i had hitherto seen but dimly they were many and somewhat contradictory in character the floor was bare the first bare floor i had come upon but the shades in the windows the chintz covered lounges drawn up beside tables bestrewn with books and other objects of comfort and luxury bespoke a place in common if not every day use a faint smell of tobacco assured me in whose use and from the minute i recognized that this was william's sanctum my curiosity grew unbounded and i neglected nothing which would be likely to attract the keenest-eyed detective in mr grice's force there were several things to be noted there first that this lumbering lout of a man read but only on one topic vivisection secondly that he was not a reader merely for there were instruments in the cases heaped up on the tables about me and in one corner it made me a little sick but i persevered in searching out the corners 
a glass case with certain horrors in it which i took care to note but which it is not necessary for me to describe another corner was blocked up by a closet which stood out in the room in a way to convince me it had been built in after the room was otherwise finished as i crossed over to examine the door which did not appear to me to be quite closed i noticed on the floor at my feet a huge discoloration this was the worst thing i had yet encountered and while i did not feel quite justified in giving it a name i could not but feel some regret for the worm-eaten rags of the drawing-room which after all are more comfortable underfoot than bare boards with such suggestive marks upon them as these the door to the closet was as i had expected slightly ajar a fact for which i was profoundly grateful for set it down to breeding or a natural recognition of other people's rights i would have found it most difficult to turn the knob of a closet door inspection of which had not been offered me but finding it open i gave it just a little pull and found well it was a surprise much more so than the sight of a skeleton would have been that the whole interior was taken up by a small circular staircase such as you find in public libraries where the books are piled up in tiers it stretched from the floor to the ceiling and dark as it was i thought i detected the outlines of a trap-door by means of which communication was established with the room above anxious to be convinced of this i consulted with myself as to what a detective would do in my place the answer came readily enough mount the stairs and feel for yourself whether there is a lock there but my delicacy or shall i acknowledge it for once an instinct of timidity seemed to restrain me till a remembrance of mr gryce's sarcastic look which i had seen honouring lesser occasions than these came to nerve me and i put foot on the stairs which had last been trod by whom shall i say william let us hope by william and william only being tall i had to mount but a few steps before reaching the ceiling pausing for breath the air being close and the stairs steep i reached up and felt for the hinge or clasp i had every reason to expect to encounter i found it almost immediately and satisfied now that nothing but a board separated me from the room above i tried that board with my finger and was astonished to feel it yield as this was a wholly unexpected discovery i drew back and asked myself if it would be wise to pursue it to the point of raising this door and had hardly settled the question in my own mind when the sound of a voice raised in a soothing murmur revealed the fact that the room above was not empty and that i would be committing a grave indiscretion in thus tampering with a means of entrance possibly under the very eye of the person speaking if the voice i had heard had been all that had come to my ears i might have ventured after a moment of hesitation to brave the displeasure of miss knollys by an attempt which would have at once satisfied me as to the correctness of the suspicions which were congealing my blood as i stood there but another voice the heavy and threatening voice of william had broken into this murmur and i knew that if i so much as awakened in him the least suspicion of my whereabouts i would have to dread an anger that might not know where to stop i therefore rested from further efforts in this direction and fearing he might bethink him of some errand which would bring him to the trap-door himself i began a retreat which i made slow only from my desire not to make any noise i succeeded as well as if my feet had been shod in velvet and my dress had been made of wool instead of a rustling silk and when once again i found myself planted in the centre of the flower-parlour the closet door closed 
and no evidence remaining of my late attempt to probe this family secret i drew a deep breath of relief that was but a symbol of my devout thankfulness i did not mean to remain much longer in this spot of evil suggestions but spying the corner of a book protruding from under a cushion on one of the lounges i had a curiosity to see if it were similar to the others i had handled drawing it out i took one look at it i need not tell what it was but after a hasty glance here and there through its pages i put it back shuddering if any doubt remained in my breast that william was one of those monsters who feed their morbid cravings by experiments upon the weak and defenceless it had been dispelled by what i had just seen in this book however i did not leave the room immediately as it was of the greatest importance that i should be able to locate in which of the many apartments on the floor above the supposed prisoner was lodged i cast about me for the means of doing this through the location of the room in which i then was as this could only be done by affixing some token to the window which could be recognized from without i thought first of thrusting the end of my handkerchief through one of the slats of the outside blinds secondly of simply leaving one of these blinds ajar and finally of chipping off a piece with the penknife i always carry with innumerable other small things in the bag i invariably wear at my side fashion i hold counts for nothing against convenience this last seemed by much the best device a handkerchief could be discovered and pulled out an open blind could be shut but a sliver once separated from the wood of the casement nothing could replace it or even cover it up without itself attracting attention taking out my knife i glanced at the door leading into the hall found it still shut and everything quiet behind it then i took a look into the shrubs and bushes of the yard outside and observing nothing to disturb me snipped off a bit from one of the outer edges of the slats and then carefully reclosed the blinds and the window i was crossing the threshold when i heard a rapid footstep in the hall miss knollys was hastening down the hall to my side oh miss butterworth she exclaimed with one quick look into the room i was leaving this is william's den the one spot he never allows any of us to enter i don't know how the key came to be upon the string it never was before and i am afraid he never will forgive me he need never know that i have been the victim of such a mistake said i my feet leave no trail and as i use no perfumes he will never suspect that i have enjoyed a glimpse of these old-fashioned walls and ancient cabinets the slats of the blinds are a little open she remarked her eyes searching my face for some sign that i am sure she did not find there were they so when you came in i hardly think so it was very dark shall i put them as i found them no he will not notice and she hurried me out still eyeing me breathlessly as if she half distrusted my composure come amelia i now whispered in self-admonition the time for exertion has come show this young woman who is not much behind you in self-control some of the lighter phases of your character charm her amelia charm her or you may live to rue this invasion into family secrets more than you may like to acknowledge at the present moment a task of some difficulty but i rejoice in difficult tasks and before another half hour had passed i had the satisfaction of seeing miss knollys entirely restored to that state of placid melancholy which was the natural expression of her calm but unhappy nature we visited the shell cabinet the blue parlour and another room the peculiarities of which i have forgotten frightened by the result of leaving me to my own devices she did not quit me for an instant 
and when my curiosity quite satisfied i hinted that a short nap in my own room would rest me for the evening she proceeded with me to the door of my apartment the locksmith whom i saw this morning has not kept his word i remarked as she was turning away none of the tradesmen here do that was her cold answer i have given up expecting having any attention paid to my wants hm, thought i another pleasant admission amelia butterworth this has not been a cheerful day End of chapter 17chapter 18 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain the second night i cannot say that i looked forward to the night with any very cheerful anticipations the locksmith having failed to keep his appointment i was likely to have no more protection against intrusion than i had had the night before and while i cannot say that i especially feared any unwelcome entrance into my apartment i should have gone to my rest with a greater sense of satisfaction if a key had been in the lock and that key had been turned by my own hand on my own side of the door the atmosphere of gloom which settled down over the household after the evening meal seemed like the warning note of something strange and evil awaiting us so marked was this that many in my situation would have further disturbed these girls by some allusion to the fact but that was not the role i had set myself to play at this crisis i remembered what mr gryce had said about winning their confidence and though the turmoil evident in lucetta's mind and the distraction visible even in the careful miss knollys led me to expect a culmination of some kind before the night was over i not only hid my recognition of this fact but succeeded in sufficiently impressing them with the contentment which my own petty employments afforded me i am never idle even in other persons houses for them to spare me the harassment of their alternate visits which in their present mood and mine promised little in the way of increased knowledge of their purposes and much in the way of distraction and the loss of that nerve upon which i calculated for a successful issue out of the possible difficulties of this night had i been a woman of ordinary courage i would have sounded three premonitory notes upon my whistle before blowing out my candle but while i am not lacking i hope in many of the finer feminine qualities which link me to my sex i have but few of that sex's weaknesses and none of its instinctive reliance upon others which leads it so often to neglect its own resources till i saw good reasons for summoning the police i proposed to preserve a discreet silence a premature alarm being in their eyes as i knew from many talks with mr gryce the one thing suggestive of a timid and inexperienced mind hannah had brought me a delicious cup of tea at ten the influence of which was to make me very drowsy at eleven but i shook this weakness off and began my night's watch in a state of stern composure which i verily believe would have awakened mr gryce's admiration had it been consonant with the proprieties for him to have seen it indeed the very seriousness of the occasion was such that i could not have trembled if i would every nerve and faculty being strained to their utmost to make the most of every sound which might arise in the now silent and discreetly darkened house i had purposely omitted the precaution of pushing my bed against the door of my room as i had done the night before being anxious to find myself in a position to cross its threshold at the least alarm that this would come i felt positive for hannah in leaving my room had taken pains to say in unconscious imitation of what miss knollys had remarked the night before don't let any queer sounds you may hear disturb you miss butterworth there's nothing to hurt you in this house nothing at all 
an admonition which i am sure her young mistresses would not have allowed her to utter if they had been made acquainted with her intention but though in a state of high expectation and listening as i supposed with every faculty alert the sounds i apprehended delayed so long that i began after an hour or two unaccountably to nod in my chair and before i knew it i was asleep with the whistle in my hand and my feet pressed against the panels of the door i had set myself to guard how deep that sleep was or how long i indulged in it i can only judge from the state of emotion in which i found myself when i suddenly woke i was sitting there still but my usually calm frame was in a violent tremble and i found it difficult to stir much more to speak some one or something was at my door an instant and my powerful nature would have asserted itself but before this could happen the stealthy step drew nearer and i heard the quiet almost noiseless insertion of a key into the lock and the quick turn which made me a prisoner this with the indignation it caused brought me quickly to myself so the door had a key after all and this was the use it was reserved for rising quickly to my feet i shouted out the names of Lorene, lucetta and william but received no other response than the rapid withdrawal of feet down the corridor then i felt for the whistle which had somehow slipped from my hand but failed to find it in the darkness nor when i went to search for the matches to relight the candle i had left standing on a table near by could i by any means succeed in igniting one so that i presently had the pleasure of finding myself shut up in my room with no means of communicating with the world outside and with no light to render the situation tolerable this was having the tables turned upon me with a vengeance and in a way for which i could not account i could understand why they had locked me in the room and why they had not heeded my cry of indignant appeal but i could not comprehend how my whistle came to be gone nor why the matches which were sufficiently plentiful in the safe refused one and all to perform their office on these points i felt it necessary to come to some sort of conclusion before i proceeded to invent some way out of my difficulties so dropping on my knees by the chair in which i had been sitting i began a quiet search for the petty object upon which nevertheless hung not my safety perhaps but all chances of success in an undertaking which was every moment growing more serious i did not find it but i did find where it had gone in the floor near the door my hand encountered a hole which had been covered up by a rug early in the evening but which i now distinctly remembered having pushed aside with my feet when i took my seat there this aperture was not large but it was so deep that my hand failed to reach to the bottom of it and into this hole by some freak of chance had slipped the small whistle i had so indiscreetly taken into my hand the mystery of the matches was less easy of solution so i let it go after a moment of indecisive thought and bent my energies once again to listen when suddenly and without the least warning there rose from somewhere in the house a cry so wild and unearthly that i started up appalled and for a moment could not tell whether i was labouring under some fearful dream or a still more fearful reality a rushing of feet in the distance and an involuntary murmur of voices soon satisfied me however on this score and drawing upon every energy i possessed i listened for a renewal of the cry which was yet curdling my blood but none came and presently all was as still as if no sound had arisen to disturb the midnight though every fibre in my body told me that the event i had feared 
the event of which i hardly dared mention the character even to myself had taken place and that i who was sent there to forestall it was not only a prisoner in my room but a prisoner through my own folly and my inordinate love of tea the anger with which i contemplated this fact and the remorse i felt at the consequences which had befallen the innocent victim whose scream i had just heard made me very wide awake indeed and after an ineffectual effort to make my voice heard from the window i called my usual philosophy to my aid and decided that since the worst had happened and i a prisoner had to await events like any other weak and defenceless woman i might as well do it with calmness and in a way to win my own approval at least the dupe of william and his sisters i would not be the dupe of my own fears or even of my own regrets the consequence was a renewed equanimity and a gentle brooding over the one event of the day which brought no regret in its train the ride with mr trome and the acquaintanceship to which it had led were topics upon which i could rest with great soothing effect through the weary hours stretching between me and daylight consequently of mr trome i thought whether the almost deathly quiet into which the house had now fallen or the comforting nature of my meditations held inexorably to the topic i had chosen acted as a soporific upon me i cannot tell but greatly as i dislike to admit it feeling sure that you will expect to hear i kept myself awake all that night i insensibly sank from great alertness to an easy indifference to my surroundings and from that to vague dreams in which beds of lilies and trellises covered with roses mingled strangely with narrow winding staircases whose tops ended in the swaying branches of great trees and so into quiet and a nothingness that were only broken into by a rap at my door and a cheerful eight o'clock ma'am the young ladies are waiting i bounded literally bounded from my chair such a summons after such a night what did it mean i was sitting half dressed in my chair before my door in a straitened and uncomfortable attitude and therefore had not dreamed that i had been upon the watch all night yet the sunshine in the room the cheery tones such as i had not heard even from this woman before seemed to argue that my imagination had played me false and that no horrors had come to disturb my rest or render my waking distressing stretching out my hand toward the door i was about to open it when i bethought me turn the key in the lock said i somebody was careful enough of my safety to fasten me in last night an exclamation of astonishment came from outside the door there is no key here ma'am the door is not locked shall i open it and come in i was about to say yes in my anxiety to talk to the woman but remembering that nothing was to be gained by letting it be seen to what an extent i had carried my suspicions i hastily disrobed and crept into bed pulling the coverings about me i assumed a comfortable attitude and then cried come in the door immediately opened there ma'am what did i tell you locked this door why the key has been lost for months i cannot help it i protested but with little if any asperity for it did not suit me that she should see i was moved by any extraordinary feeling a key was put in that lock about midnight and i was locked in it was about the time someone screamed in your own part of the house screamed her brows took a fine pucker of perplexity oh that must have been miss lucetta lucetta yes ma'am she had an attack i believe poor miss lucetta she often has attacks like that confounded for the woman spoke so naturally 
that only a suspicious nature like mine would fail to have been deceived by it, I raised myself on my elbow and gave her an indignant look. Yet you said just now that the young ladies were expecting me to breakfast. Yes, and why not? Her look was absolutely guileless. Miss Lucetta sometimes keeps us up half the night, but she does not miss breakfast on that account. When the turn is over, she is as well as ever she was. A fine young lady, Miss Lucetta. I'd lose my two hands for her any day. She certainly is a remarkable girl, I declared, not, however, as dryly as I felt. I can hardly believe I dreamed about the key. Let me feel of your pocket, I laughed. She, without the smallest hesitancy, pulled aside her apron. I am sorry you put so little confidence in my word, ma'am, but, law me, what you heard is nothing to what some of our guests have complained of, in the days, I mean, when we did have guests. I have known them to scream out themselves in the middle of the night, and vow they saw white figures creeping up and down the halls. All nonsense, ma'am, but believed in by some folks. You don't look as if you believed in ghosts. And I don't, I said, not a whit. It would be a poor way to try to frighten me. How is Mr. William this morning? Oh, he's well and feeding the dogs, ma'am. What made you think of him? Politeness, Hannah, I found myself forced to say. He's the only man in the house. Why shouldn't I think of him? She fingered her apron a minute and laughed. I didn't know you liked him. He's so rough. It isn't everybody who understands him, she said. Must one understand a person to like him? I queried good-humouredly. I was beginning to think I might have dreamed about that key. I don't know, she said. I don't always understand Miss Lucetta, but I like her through and through, ma'am, as I like this little finger. And holding up this member to my inspection, she crossed the room for my water pitcher, which she proposed to fill with hot water. I followed her closely with my eyes. When she came back, I saw her attention caught by the break in the flooring, which she had not noticed on entering. Oh, she exclaimed, what a shame, her honest face colouring as she drew the rug back over the small black gap. I am sure, ma'am, she cried, you must think very poorly of us. But I assure you, ma'am, it's honest poverty, nothing but honest poverty as makes them so neglectful and with an air as far removed from mystery as her frank good-natured manner seemed to be from falsehood she slid from the room with a kind don't hurry ma'am it is miss knollys's turn in the kitchen and she isn't as quick as miss lucetta hm, thought i supposing i had called in the police but by the time she had returned with the water my doubts had reawakened she was not changed in manner, though I have no doubt she had recounted all that I had said below. But I was, for I remembered the matches, and thought I saw a way of tripping her up in her self-complacency. Just as she was leaving me for the second time, I called her back. What is the matter with your matches? I asked. I couldn't make them light last night. With a wholly undisturbed countenance, she turned toward the bureau and took up the china trinket that held the few remaining matches I had not scraped on the piece of sandpaper I myself had fastened up alongside the door. A sheepish cry of dismay at once escaped her. Why, these are old matches, she declared, showing me the box in which a half dozen or so burned matches stood with their burned tops all turned down. I thought they were all right. I am afraid we are a little short of matches. I did not like to tell her what I thought about it, but it made me doubly anxious to join the young ladies at breakfast and judge for myself from their conduct and expression if I had been deceived by my own fears into taking for realities the fantasies of a nightmare or whether I was correct in ascribing to fact 
that episode of the key with all the possibilities that lay behind it i did not let my anxiety however stand in the way of my duty mr gryce had bid me carry the whistle he had sent me constantly about my person and i felt that he would have the right to reproach me if i left my room without making some endeavour to recover this lost article how to do this without aid or appliances of any kind was a problem i knew where it was but i could not see it much less reach it besides they were waiting for me never a pleasant thought it occurred to me that i might lower into the hole a lighted candle hung by a string looking over my effects i chose out a hairpin a candle and two corset laces pardon me i am as modest as most of my sex but i am not squeamish corset laces are strings and as such only i present them to your notice i should like to have added a button-hook to my collection but not having as yet discarded the neatly laced boot of my ancestor i could only produce a small article from my toilet service which shall remain unmentioned as i presently discarded it and turned my whole attention to the other objects i have named a poor array but out of them i hoped to find the means of fishing up my lost whistle my intention was to lower first a lighted candle into the hole by means of a string tied about its middle then to drop a line on the whistle thus discovered and draw it up with the point of a bent hairpin which i fondly hoped i could make do the service of a hook to think was to try the candle was soon down in the hole and by its light the whistle was easily seen the string and bent hairpin went down next i was successful in hooking the prize and proceeded to pull it up with great care for an instant i realized what a ridiculous figure i was cutting stooping over a hole in the floor on both knees a string in each hand leading apparently to nowhere and i at work cautiously steadying one and as carefully pulling on the other having hooked the string holding the whistle over the first finger of the hand holding the candle i may have become too self-conscious to notice the slight release of weight on the whistle hand whatever the reason when the end of the string came in sight there was no whistle on it the charred end showed me that the candle had burned the cord letting the whistle fall again out of reach down went the candle again it touched bottom but no whistle was to be seen after a long and fruitless search i concluded to abandon my whistle fishing excursion and rising from my cramped and undignified position i proceeded to pull up the candle to my surprise and delight i found the whistle firmly stuck to the lower side of it some drops of candle grease had fallen upon the whistle where it lay the candle coming in contact with it the two had adhered and i became indebted to accident rather than to acumen for the restoration of the precious article end of chapter 18chapter 19 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain a knot of crape i was prepared for some change in the appearance of my young hostesses but not for so great a one as i saw on entering the dining room that memorable morning the blinds which were always half closed were now wide open and under the cheerful influence of the light which was thus allowed to enter the table and all its appointments had a much less dreary look than before behind the urn sat miss knollys with a smile on her lips and in the window william stood whistling a cheerful air unrebuked lucetta was not present 
but to my great astonishment she presently walked in with her hands laden with sprays of morning glory which she flung down in the centre of the board it was the first time i had seen any attempt made by any of them to lighten the sombreness of their surroundings and it was also the first time i had seen the three together i was more disconcerted by this simple show of improved spirits than i liked to acknowledge in the first place they were natural and not forced and secondly they were to all appearance unconscious they were not marked enough to show relief and in lucetta especially did not serve to hide the underlying melancholy of a disappointed girl yet it was not what i expected from my supposed experiences of the night and led me to answer a little warily when with a frank laugh Laureen exclaimed so you have lost your character as a practical woman miss butterworth hannah tells me you were the victim of a ghostly visit last night hannah gossips unmercifully was my cautious and somewhat peevish reply if i chose to dream that i was locked into my room by some erratic spectre i cannot see why she should take the confession of my folly out of my mouth i was going to relate the fact myself with all the accompaniments of rushing steps and wild and unearthly cries which are expected by the listeners to a veritable ghost story but now i have simply to defend myself from a charge of credulity it's too bad miss knollys much too bad i did not come to a haunted house for this my manner rather than my words seemed to completely deceive them perhaps it deceived myself for i began to feel a loss of the depression which had weighed upon me ever since that scream rang in my ears at midnight it disappeared still further when lucetta said if your ramblings through the old rooms on this floor were the occasion of this nightmare you must be prepared for a recurrence of the same to-night for i am going to take you through the upper rooms myself this morning isn't that the programme Laureen? or have you changed your mind and planned a drive for miss butterworth she shall do both Laureen answered when she is tired of tramping through dusty chambers and examining the decayed remnants of old furniture which encumber them William stands ready to drive her over the hills, where she will find views well worth her attention. Thank you, said I. It is a pleasant prospect. But inwardly I uttered anything but thanks, rather asked myself if I had not played the part of a fool in ascribing so much importance to the events of the past night, and decided almost without an argument that I had. However, beliefs die hard in a mind like mine and though i was ready to consider that an inflamed imagination may often carry us beyond the bounds of fact and even into the realm of fancy and misconception i yet was not ready to give up my suspicions altogether or to acknowledge that i had no foundation for the fear that something uncanny if not awful had taken place under this roof the night before the very naturalness i observed in this hitherto restrained trio might be the result of the removal of some great strain and if that was the case ah well alertness is the motto of the truly wise it is when vigilance sleeps that the enemy gains the victory i would not let myself be deceived even at the cost of a little ridicule amelia butterworth was still awake even under a semblance of well-laid suspicion. My footsteps were not dogged after this, as they had hitherto been in my movements about the house. I was allowed to go and come, and even to stray into the second long corridor, without any other let than my own discretion and good breeding. Lucetta joined me, to be sure, after a while, but only as guide and companion she took me into rooms i forgot the next minute and into others i remember to this day as quaint memorials of a past ever and always interesting to me we ransacked the house yet after all was over and i sat down to rest in my own room two formidable questions rose in my mind for which i found no satisfactory answer 
why with so many more or less attractive bedchambers at their command had they chosen to put me into a hole where the very flooring was unsafe and the outlook the most dismal that could be imagined and why in all our peregrinations in and out of rooms had we always passed one door without entering she had said that it was williams a sufficient explanation if true and i have no doubt it was but the change of countenance with which she passed it and the sudden lightening of her tread so instinctive that she was totally unconscious of it marked that door as one it would be my duty to enter if fate should yet give me the opportunity that it was the one in communication with the flower parlour i felt satisfied but in order to make assurance doubly sure i resolved upon a tour through the shrubbery outside that i might compare the location of the window having the chipped blind with that of this room which was as well as i could calculate the third from the rear on the left hand side when therefore william called up to know if i was ready for my drive i answered back that i found myself very tired and would be glad to exchange the pleasure he offered for a visit to the stables this as i expected caused considerable comment and some disturbance they wanted me to repeat my experience of the day before and spend two if not more hours of the morning out of the house but i did not mean to gratify them indeed i felt that my duty held me to the house and was so persistent in my wishes or rather in my declaration of them that all opposition had to give way even in the stubborn william i thought you had a dread of dogs was the final remark with which he endeavoured to turn me aside from my purpose i have three in the barn and two in the stable and they make a great fuss when i come around i assure you then they will have enough to do without noticing me said i with a brazen assumption of courage sufficiently surprising if i had had any real intention of invading a place so guarded but i had not i no more meant to enter the stables than to jump off the housetop but it was necessary that i should start for them and make the start from the left wing of the house how i managed the intractable william and led him as i did from bush to bush and shrub to shrub up and down the length of that interminable facade of the left wing would make an interesting story in itself the curiosity i showed in plants even such plants as had survived the neglect that had made a wilderness of this old-time garden the indifference which contrary to all my habits i persisted in manifesting to every inconvenience i encountered in the way of straightforward walking to any object i set my fancy upon examining the knowledge i exhibited and the interest which i took it for granted he felt in all i discovered and all i imparted to him would form the basis of a farce of no ordinary merit had it not had its birth in interests and intents bordering on the tragic a row of bushes of various species ran along the wall and covered in some instances the lower ledges of the first row of windows as i made for a certain shrub which i had observed growing near what i supposed to be the casement from whose blind i had chipped a small sliver i allowed my enthusiasm to bubble over in my evident desire to display my erudition this said i is without any doubt at all a stunted but undoubted specimen of that rare tree found seldom north of the thirtieth degree the magnolia grandiflora i have never seen it but once before and that was in the botanical gardens in washington note its leaves you have noted its flowers smaller undoubtedly than they should be but then you must acknowledge it has been in a measure neglected are they not fine here i pulled a branch down which interfered with my view of the window there was no chip visible in the blinds thus discovered seeing this i let the branch go but the oddest feature of this tree 
and one with which you are perhaps not acquainted i wonder if anybody is is that it will not grow within twenty feet of any plant which scatters pollen see for yourself this next shrub bears no flower i was moving along the wall nor this i drew down a branch as i spoke caught sight of the mark i was looking for and let the bough spring back i had found the window i wanted his grunts and groans during all this formed a running accompaniment which would have afforded me great secret amusement had my purpose been less serious as it was i could pay but little attention to him especially after i had stepped back far enough to take a glance at the window over the one i had just located as that of the flower parlour it was as i expected the third one from the rear corner but it was not this fact which gave me a thrill of feeling so strong that i have never had harder work to preserve my equanimity it was the knot of black crepe with which the shutters were tied together end of chapter 19chapter 20 of lost man's lane by anna catherine green this librivox recording is in the public domain questions i kept the promise i had made to myself and did not go to the stables had i intended to go there i could not have done so after the discovery i have just mentioned it awakened too many thoughts and contradictory surmises if this knot was a signal for whom was this signal meant if it was a mere acknowledgment of death how reconcile the sentimentality which prompted such an acknowledgment with the monstrous and diseased passions lying at the base of the whole dreadful occurrence lastly if it was the result of pure carelessness a bit of crape having been caught up and used for a purpose for which any ordinary string would have answered what a wonderful coincidence between it and my thoughts a coincidence indeed amounting almost to miracle marvelling at the whole affair and deciding nothing i allowed myself to stroll down alone to the gate william having left me at my peremptory refusal to drag my skirts any longer through the briars the day being bright and the sunshine warm the road looked less gloomy than usual especially in the direction of the village and deacon spear's cottage the fact is that anything seemed better than the grim and lowering walls of the house behind me if my home was there so was my dread and i welcomed the sight of mother jane's heavy figure bent over her herbs at the door of her hut a few paces to my left where the road turned had she not been deaf i believed i would have called her as it was i contented myself with watching the awkward swayings of her body as she pottered to and fro among her turnips and carrots my eyes were still on her when i suddenly heard the clatter of a horse's hoofs on the highway looking up i encountered the trim figure of mr trome bending to me from a fine sorrel good morning miss butterworth it's a great relief to me to see you in such good health and spirits this morning were the pleasant words with which he endeavoured perhaps to explain his presence in a spot more or less under a ban it was certainly a surprise what right had i to look for such attentions from a man whose acquaintance i had made only the day before it touched me little as i am in the habit of allowing myself to be ruled by trivial sentimentalities and though i was discreet enough to avoid any further recognition of his kindness than was his due from a lady of great self-respect he was evidently sufficiently gratified by my response to draw rein and pause for a moment's conversation under the pine trees this for the moment seemed so natural that i forgot that more than one pair of eyes might be watching me from the windows behind us eyes which might wonder at a meeting which to the foolish understandings of the young might have the look of premeditation but pshaw 
I am talking as if I were twenty instead of... Well, I will leave you to consult our family record on that point. There are certain secrets which even the wisest among us cannot be blamed for preserving. How did you pass the night? was Mr. Trome's first question. I hope in all due peace and quiet. Thank you, I returned, not seeing why I should increase his anxiety in my regard. I have nothing to complain of. I had a dream, but dreams are to be expected where one has to pass a half dozen empty rooms to one's apartment. He could not restrain his curiosity. A dream, he repeated. I do not believe in sleep that is broken by dreams unless they are of the most cheerful sort possible, and I judge from what you say that yours were not cheerful. I wanted to confide in him. I felt that in a way he had a right to know what had happened to me, or what I thought had happened to me, under this roof, and yet I did not speak. What I could tell would sound so puerile in the broad sunshine that enveloped us. I merely remarked that cheerfulness was not to be expected in a domicile so given over to the ravages of time. And then, with that lightness and versatility which characterize me under certain exigencies, I introduced a topic we could discuss without any embarrassment to himself or me. Do you see Mother Jane over there? I asked. I had some talk with her yesterday. She seems like a harmless imbecile. Very harmless, he acquiesced. Her only fault is greed. That is insatiable. Yet it is not strong enough to take her a quarter of a mile from this place. Nothing could do that, I think. She believes that her daughter Lizzie is still alive and will come back to the hut some day. It's very sad when you think that the girl's dead and has been dead nearly forty years. Why does she harp on numbers? I asked. I heard her mutter certain ones over and over. That is a mystery none of us have ever been able to solve, said he. Possibly she has no reason for it. The vagaries of the witless are often quite unaccountable. He remained looking at me long after he had finished speaking, not, I felt sure, from any connection he found between what he had just said and anything to be observed in me, but from... Well, I was glad that I had been carefully trained in my youth to pay the greatest attention to my morning toilets. Any woman can look well at night, and many women in the flush of a bright afternoon, but the woman who looks well in the morning needs not always to be young to attract the appreciative gaze of a man of real penetration. Mr. Trome was such a man, and I did not begrudge him the pleasure he showed in my neat grey silk and carefully adjusted collar. But he said nothing, and a short silence ensued, which was perhaps more of a compliment than otherwise. Then he uttered a short sigh and lifted the reins. If only I were not debarred from entering, he smiled, with a short gesture toward the house. I did not answer. Even I understand that on occasion the tongue plays but a sorry part in interviews of this nature. He sighed again and uttered some short encouragement to his horse, which started that animal up and sent him slowly pacing down the road toward the cheerful clearing whither my own eyes were looking with what I was determined should not be construed even by the most sanguine into a glance of anything like wistfulness. As he went, he made a bow I have never seen surpassed in my own parlour in Gramercy Park, and upon my bestowing upon him a return nod, glanced up at the house with an intentness which seemed to increase as some object, invisible to me at that moment, caught his eye. As that eye was directed toward the left wing, and lifted as far as the second row of windows, I could not help asking myself if he had seen the knot of crape which had produced upon me so lugubrious an impression. Before I could make sure of this, 
he had passed from sight and the highway fell again into shadow why i hardly knew for the sun certainly had been shining a few minutes before end of chapter twenty